colleagues, dear colleagues, it's my pleasure for the first time to chair your committee. And uh, I'd like to call our meeting of the third uh, committee on democracy, human rights, and humanitarian questions to order. Point two, my opening remarks. The draft agenda of this meeting has been circulated. Could we adopt it? Adopt it. Thank you. We have a busy agenda. First, with our rapporteur, Mr. Kyriakos Hadiyani of Cyprus, whom you all know. Welcome. Thank you. And then Ambassador, Ambassador Ivo Sramek, Chairperson of the Human Dimension Committee of the OSCE Permanent Council and Permanent Representative of the Czech Republic to the OSCE. Welcome, Excellency. Thank you for joining us. On my other side, we have Director Inge Björk, Solrun Gisla Dottir, Director of the ODIR, OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. Thank you, Inge Björk, for having come for, from uh, Warsaw to Vienna to speak to us. And we also have with us Mr. Harlem Desir, OSCE representative on freedom of the media. We are also looking forward to hear from you. Before giving the floor to our rapporteur, let me say a few words about my activities as chair of this committee. I'm pleased that the OSCEPA had an unprecedentedly strong participation in the OSCE's Human Dimension Implementation Meeting this past September in Warsaw. I was pleased to personally contribute to this, the region's largest human rights conference, and I encourage you all to consider attending the HDIM in Warsaw in September. Then I was also very pleased to travel to Uzbekistan to participate in a major human rights conference in Samarkand. I have enjoyed very close work with my colleagues Michael Link and Vice Chair and Kiriakos Haidiani, Rapporteur, and you have been able to read on quite a few occasions our statements and communications which we have done jointly. I think this is a strong sign on behalf of our committee and I thank them both for their work and cooperation. And also, we, Andreas Baker, who is serving our committee as a secretary with all his knowledge and uh, capacity, he is a strong, strong, strong support for our, um, for our leadership. We have been putting our priority on the human rights and humanitarian situation of people in conflict-affected areas. This was particularly evident by our major visit to Ukraine in December, which I hope you have read about. There are many issues to consider in many countries. We have sometimes acted publicly when we thought it was particularly urgent and important to speak out. In the face of persistent and grievous problems, I think this is our responsibility. However, we have also at times had private contacts, bilateral contacts. We do this in the hopes of having a constructive, sometimes informal dialogue that can also result in positive changes. Personally, I have appreciated the exchanges that I've had with a number of your delegations on human rights concerns. Our contacts and comments have related to a number of issues in a number of countries. 
including Armenia, Azerbaijan, Russian Federation, Ukraine, Turkey, Afghanistan, and others. I will not go into further detail on these various issues, other than to say that we are a team, the four of us here, uh, that try to be as engaged as possible uh, for the mandate uh, PAOSCE has given to us on democracy, human rights, and humanitarian questions. Mikhail Link, Kiriakos Haidiani, and me will be holding a number of meetings with colleagues from various countries tomorrow here in Vienna to discuss human rights challenges throughout our countries. We thank all of them and you for the spirit of open dialogue we can have with each other even on difficult issues. It is up to all of us to respect and promote human rights both at home and abroad and I am sure that our discussions today will contribute to our abilities to do this. I note, uh, yes, uh, we will uh, answer questions or remarks after the report uh, given to you by our rapporteur, and I invite now Kiriakos Hadiani from Cyprus as our long-standing experienced rapporteur to share his ideas and intentions with you regarding his report for the 28th annual session in Luxembourg. Mr. Haidiani, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I want to thank uh, Margarita, Michael, and also Andreas Baker for the excellent cooperation that we have all this time as a team. Dear members of the Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, 71 years after the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and 44 years after the adoption of the Helsinki Final Act, we must today reaffirm our commitment towards the principles of the Declaration and the Final Act and to update them for the present and the future of our peoples. There is a crucial, crucial question for which should be we constantly answer. Can we still hope that the current system of human rights protection can survive? The answer is clear. The answer is very clear. Yes, if, even if the current system and the principle of the Helsinki Final Act are experiencing a crisis, human rights protection is involved in and developing in response to new emerging needs, the expectations of our peoples and new risk, which arise from various new fields such as digital technology or climate, climate change. Unfortunately, in our days, we are witnessing a regression in human rights protection. We see grave violations of human rights, including torture, extrajudicial killings, and detention without a trial. We are witnesses, genocides, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Impunity for human rights abuse is becoming a permanent future in many countries caught in conflicts. But at the same time, authoritarianism is increasing, while nationalism and xenophobia that are developing, particularly in countries of first reception of migrants and asylum seekers, are a step backwards from the standards of international protection of human rights as developed over the past 71 years. Populist, neo-Nazism and antisemitism. The trend of growing populism in 2018 is continuing, 
unabated in 2019. We continue to see the demonization of minorities and an affront against human rights principle, as well as a growing distrust towards democratic institutions. As antisemitism is also on the rise, political leaders must take a strong stance against neo-Nazis so that antisemitism can be fought at the crime it is. Hate speech is another phenomenon that democratic societies can face collectively. It is necessary to form a coalition that aims to combat hatred and intolerance. Participating states should report on each other and exchange information on hate speech and much more. Human rights as a dimension of foreign policy. The rise of populists has led countries that have traditionally supported the promotion of human rights in the international scene to be less vocal. The, the weight of human rights protection in the foreign policy in, of participating states is becoming increasingly weaker. States are not addressing violation of human rights with appropriating severity. The growing weakening of international oversight of democratic and rule of law standards is exploited by countries with oppressive leaders, allowing them to act in violation of human rights principles. This is further exacerbated as mechanisms of international and judicial protection are also being further questioned. State of emergency. Under a state of emergency, human rights and the rule of law are under a constant threat. More often, often than not, national security protection serves only as a pretext to declare a state of emergency. The role of international organizations in cases where the declaration of a state of emergency is imminent is decisive. State of emergency monitoring mechanism should be developed to monitor compliance both during the period that derogations are in effect and immediately after the termination. Children in areas of military conflict. Children living in conflict zones around the world continue to suffer extreme violence and serious human rights violations in 2018. Children became victims in accidents caused by explosive remnants of war. Schools, students, teachers often became targets. Displacement of children all too often results in separation from their parents. Obstructions to their access to health care, education, clean water and san sanitation have also resurfaced as a threat in the OSC region. In eastern Ukraine, about 0.7 million children are being deprived of their right to education and are facing a host of other deadly threats. In 2019 marks the 30th anniversary of the Convention on the Right of the Child. On this occasion, we must finally make protection of our children in conflict zones our number one priority. Genocide as a war crime. Genocide is a war crime and its repet repetition in several conflicts is still an imminent danger or sadly a reality. Seventy years after the adoption of the Convention of the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, its goal remain it, its, goal, its goals remain a key challenge. Remembrance of genocide is necessary so as to cultivate awareness and prevent the repetition of such horrific crimes. States must exhibit greater determination for the eradication of modern type of slavery, namely human trafficking, sexual exploitation, child labor, forced marriages, coercive military recruitment of children and their use in armed conflicts as well as economic exploitation. Particular focus must be placed on the dire consequences of this ill phenomenon on children's physical, mental, moral and social development. Development. A particular vulnerable group are stateless children who have re restricted access to basic rights and services and may face lifelong discrimination. Moreover, 
being deprived from official documents, they run the risk of being subjected to violence and trafficking. Every child has the right to have a name and a citizenship. Governments are called upon to take all necessary measures in order to stateless children to understand their right to citizenship. Refugees fleeing war areas and usually having an illegal, illegal resident status face health problems, discrimination and persecution. Unaccompanied children face a particularly serious problem as they are vulnerable to health and social risk. Ensuring refugees based in human rights to health and their access to national health systems consti constitutes the best strategies in terms of saving lives, minimizing the cost of care and protecting the local population. In several OSCE participating states, the freedom of the media, media is severely challenged as journalists, journalists suffer great repression, with an increased number of them having been killed, imprisoned, or abducted in 2018. Totalitarian regimes, corruption, drug trafficking, and other ill phenomena are at open war with independent, particularly investigative journalists who are exposed to very hazardous living conditions. Even more so that crimes are not adequately investigated and perpetrators remain unpunished. States must end impunity and find ways to effective resource to justice. Similarly, human rights activist, activists are often victims of their criticism of state's authorities. There are numerous cases of activists being imprisoned without trial and even going on, going on hunger strikes due to their detention in states of, emer of emergency conditions. Million of, millions of women are victims of inequality and harassment both during peace and in conflict regions. Regrettably, the goal of ending violence against women is still very remote, as the gender rhetoric continued also last year. There have been positive developments, thought, which have been reflected in new gender policies and measures adopted or announced by leaders of OSCE participating states like France, Canada, or Switzerland. Parallel positive measures have been adopted by OSCE partners for cooperation and all third countries as a result of activist stranglers for women rights. Regrettably, individuals with a different sexual orientation continue to suffer killings, persecution, torture, and other serious human rights violations in several countries and regions in OSCE. It is also the case that they remain prisoners of such regimes as official authority destroyed or confiscate their official papers, as perpetrators usually remain unpunished also in this case. There is an urgent need for OSC participating states where such phenomena occur to properly investigate them and to cooperate with OSC observers in order to adequately assess and address this very worrisome uh, situation. Regrettably, persisting conflicts have their heavy toll on human rights of civilian, civilians. In Ukraine, which counts 3,000 victims since 2014, civilians have been exposed to con countless ceasefire violations, bombings, shootings, fire and land and sea mines, while critical infrastructures have been affected. In eastern Ukraine, the needs are huge for medical health and psychological, psychological trauma care and demand protection, as well as need pertaining to shelter, health, living resources, water drainage, and water hygiene. Moreover, a lot must be done to improve crossing conditions of the so-called conduct line as 1.1 million persons cross every month risking their lives and suffering long delays in order to maintain family links and to have access to basic services. Kosovo raised concerns, a new 
and confrontation on both sides have escalated. Regarding the issue of missing persons in particular, I welcome the continuation of fair efforts by the International Commission on Missing Persons, noting, however, that this is done at a very low pace. In Cyprus, negotiation for the settlement of the Cyprus problem being now as a stalemate violation of the human rights of refugees persist. Regrettably, the program for the ascertainment of the fate of missing persons is not progressing at the necessary pace due to the fact that a great number of mortal people were buried in military zones where search is not allowed due to the lack of political will. At the same time, the OSCE must keep a close eye on important hostility in its neighborhood with tremendous human rights consequences and spillover effects. The OSC and the OSC Parliamentary Assembly must place creative focus on the early assessment and evaluation of each crisis separately. The situation in Syria, the Middle East, the Iraq, in Afghanistan, and other, of course, conflicts is one example. Despite certain positive developments following the critical phase of the war in Syria, there has been a political stalemate which has resulted in the humanitarian crisis getting worse and the country's stabilization hampered. The early assessment of potential risk will provide possibilities for implementing pre preventative policies. Upholding human dignity must lie at the head of our activities. As long as there is international cooperation, peace stands a chance and people suffer less. 2019, this year, must be the year of, of reversal of the negative trend of progress regarding human rights. This year must be a better year for human rights. Please make our assembly as the far-reaching far -reaching lighthouse of hope for the humanity. Thank you very much for your patience, and I will hear all your remarks with big attention. Congratulations, Mr. Hadi Yani. Your applause uh, shows uh, that you have been understood by our delegates, and we now have time for your ideas or remarks, if you want to present them uh, about the uh, ideas and the perspectives Mr. Haidiani has given us. Please note that I will close the speakers list in three minutes. We have, as of now, seven uh, speakers applied in the list. Piradaiu Slova, Vice Presidentu, Sinata, Uspikistana, Svetlana, Artikova. Спасибо большое, госпожа спикер. Здравствуйте, уважаемые коллеги. Хочу воспользоваться этой высокой площадкой и рассказать о тех реформах, которые происходят у меня в стране. Сегодня, кстати, об этом неоднократно говорилось, и в том числе в сфере человеческого измерения. Полагаю, что заседание этого комитета именно по демократии, по правам человека и гуманитарным вопросам является удобной площадкой для этого по одной существенной причине. ОБСЕ – это ведущий партнер Узбекистана в деле укрепления институтов демократии и обеспечения прав человека. Таким образом, можно сделать вывод – достижение моей страны в этой сфере – это одновременно достижение и структур ОБСЕ.
Важным подтверждением приверженности Узбекистана реформам в сфере защиты прав и интересов человека может служить проведение в ноябре прошлого года в Самарканде Азиатского форума по правам человека, который был посвящен 70-летию всеобщей декларации прав человека и направлен на определение и оценку значимости этого важного документа. Для чего это нужно было? Это нужно было для того, чтобы Центральноазиатский регион дальше развивался именно в сфере человеческого измерения. Здесь отрадно отметить, что в этом мероприятии приняли участие представители ведущих международных организаций правозащитной тематики, включая и ОБСЕ. Кстати, принята дорожная карта по реализации рекомендаций, принятых на форуме. Важным достижением данного форума, безусловно, считается подписание меморандума о взаимопонимании между палатами парламента Узбекистана, ГДИПЧ ОБСЕ и координатором проектов ОБСЕ. В Узбекистане. И, конечно же, в рамках этого документа планируется совместная работа по совершенствованию законотворческого процесса, механизмов осуществления парламентского контроля и, конечно, многое другое. Пользуясь случаем, разрешите выразить свою глубокую признательность госпоже Гислатадир, директору БДИПЧ ОБСЕ, господину Церетели, президенту ПАО ОБСЕ и лично вам, Маргарет, за активное участие и содействие в организации данного мероприятия. Мы прекрасно понимаем, что в Узбекистане еще много проблем, далеко не все идеально в сфере человеческого измерения. Важно другое. Важно то, что к решению накопившихся проблем мы подходим системно и осознанно. В настоящее время моя страна приветствует реализацию двухсторонних программ и проектов с международными организациями, включая БДИПЧ ОБСЕ. Это должно быть направлено на укрепление демократических институтов страны и решение социальных проблем. Уважаемые коллеги, Узбекистан сегодня открыт миру. Он динамично реформируется и развивается. Чтобы убедиться в этом, пожалуйста, приезжайте в любом качестве. Мы приветствуем любое партнерство, основанное на равноправии сторон и взаимном уважении мнений. Благодарю за внимание. Спасибо большое. Next speaker is Mr. Refat Khubarov from Ukraine. You have the floor. Благодарю докладчика комитета господина Кириакуса Хаджиани за содержательное представление идей и инициатив. Однако при всей высокой оценке изложенных в докладе концепций в сфере защиты прав человека, вынужден сказать, что неспособность институтов ОБСЕ исполнять ранее принятые решения является одной из причин совершения повторно преступлений в регионе организации. В этом контексте позволю напомнить всем нам, одной из наших предыдущих деклараций, Бакинскую, принятую на 23-й ежегодной сессии 28 июня, 2 июля 2014 года. Это была первая декларация ОБСЕ, принятая буквально по следам вооруженного вторжения российских войск на территорию Крыма и ее незаконной оккупации. В самом названии декларации, послушайте, как звучит, как мы мудро тогда закрепили суть того, что происходило в 2014 году со стороны России по отношению к Украине. Наша декларация называлась «Очевидное, грубое и неисправленное нарушение хельсинских принципов». И хочу сказать о том, что 
Российская Федерация до сегодняшнего дня не исправила ни одно из тех указанных нами, совершенных ею брутальных нарушений своих международных обязательств. Пять лет продолжающейся российской оккупации Крыма, массовые нарушения прав человека, целенаправленные системные, системные репрессии против коренного народа Крыма, крымских татар, остаются вне поля зрения институтов ОБСЕ. Специальная мониторинговая миссия ОБСЕ по Украине, которая обладает мандатами, полномочиями посещать все регионы Украины, она не может въезжать на территорию Автономной Республики Крым и города Севастополя для того, чтобы подтвердить нам грубые э, нарушения прав человека на территории Крыма, для того, чтобы э, предоставить нам доказательства насильственных похищений и убийств людей, для того, чтобы показать нам слезы э, матерей и детей более более ста полизаключенных, более половины из которых крымские татары. Совершаемые сегодня на оккупированных территориях Украины, в Крыму, а также отдельных районах Донецка и Донбасса, они остаются без нашего реагирования, и в этом есть слабость нашей организации. И мне очень хотелось бы, чтобы в наших последующих организациях наявность оккупации Крыма, она стыдливо не замалчивалась, она упоминалась в первую очередь. И то, и то вооруженное нападение, которое недавно случилось в Черном море у Керченского пролива, это есть следствие, в том числе, нашего замалчивания оккупации Крыма Российской Федерации. Не разрешение вопроса деоккупации Крыма является угрозой для того, чтобы э, такие преступления Some of us use these values as a tool, a tool to blame, to teach, to patronize. Ironically, they all look their own practices or conceal their own shortcomings. This hypocrisy is difficult to tolerate. It impedes constructive dialogue and undermines our common principles. On 15 July 2016 in Turkey, millions formed a united front against plotters who tried to suspend our country's constitution shot and killed at civilians and bombed the parliament. Unfortunately, Turkey's allies, some of our friends in the West, have been unable or unwilling to understand the threats that Turkey face and the true nature of FETO as well as other terror groups. It is unacceptable that refraining from extraditing or even worse, granting asylum the fugitive members of the terrorist organizations by our friends and allies. Turkey is a state of law. We have been and will continue to do whatever our nation's security requires within the law. No one is detained or remote from office arbitrarily without any evidence. Similarly, one participating state after the fall of the Iron Curtain suspended hundreds of thousands of civil servants due to their link to the communist regime. The same country continues to suspend public servants because of their affiliation to an extremist right group. We all should agree on one thing. Being a journalist or holding another proficiency does not prove that you are innocent or do not commit a crime. Journalists who are at the cause or being jailed are either persons who are members of PKK or aided and embedded it, or members of FETO or affiliated to Daesh, or they committed crimes like murder. After terror attacks in one participating state, persons who played down these attacks in their social media posts were immediately arrested and put on trial. In another, in another participating state, even praising terror is considered an act of terror. Similar steps in Turkey are immediately criticized. 
This is a double standard. Furthermore, political parties and their representatives are expected to stay away from terrorism, terrorist organization and directions. European officials make half-hearted statements to condemn PKK attacks, but say nothing about those who support them. They say that the EU considers the PKK a terrorist organization, but allow PKK to operate freely in Europe. Could you imagine deputies in Europe who defend Daesh, glorify their terrorist acts and defy court orders? Remember the case of a neo-Nazi party in one participating state. In 2013, its chairman and several deputies were presented with criminal charges and put in pretrial detention. We have not seen any EU official criticizing this government. Finally, those countries which display such a double standard are themselves home to extremely worrying trends. Far-right norms are gaining ground. Islamophobia, including its violent forms, is on the rise. Regrettably, these and issues are not adequately addressed very much. here in the OC. I pass the floor to Miss Laura Some countries prefer to brush this topic under the carpet. Spain. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Miss Laura Castell from Spain has the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. One week ago, the trial against Catalan pro-independence leaders began in Madrid. Twelve people stand accused of crime, of rebellion, seditions, disobedience, and embezzlement of public funds for their role in the events surrounding the referendum on independence held on 1st of October of 2017. Of these nine have spent over a year in pretrial detention, six members of the Catalan government, the president of the Catalan parliament, and two grassroots activists. We Catalans denounce the violation of the rights to the ideological freedom, freedom of expression, and the right of manifestation. And recall that the Constitution, Spanish Constitution, prohibits the criminalization of political dissent. We question the impartiality of the investigation of civil war, but also the legitimacy of the public prosecutor's office. The popular accusation of extreme right political party and the state advocacy. We can affirm that the Spain accomplished in different levels the four evidence of autocracies, according to the political scientist Juan Linz. A weak compromise with democratic rules, denying the legitimacy of adversaries, tolerance or promotion of violence as 1st of October or far extreme right self behavior show, and limitation of civil freedoms of adversaries, including the medias. According to these political scientists, the death of a democracy can take back in time at the moment when a political party shows similarity with extremists at its ideological ban instead of the moderate political parties of the other ideological side. And that is what's happening in Spain. That is what is happening in Spain. I am doing an early warning to you. In fact, it's the seventh time that I address to you, all of you, for warning about what is happening in the Spain low-cost democracy. Some of the objectives of the OCE are to promote mechanism for the prevention and resolution of conflicts and the strengthening and consolidation of democratic institutions. Now it's your turn, because political conflicts cannot be resolved in the courts. Criminal law is not the instrument for resolving political conflicts with political adversaries. I suggest Mr. Hajani to include in his report a brief analysis of the democratic situation of Catalan politicians and their violations of human and political rights and freedoms. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Next speaker is Mr. Peter Grant from United Kingdom, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I 
agree with everything that the rapporteur wants to include in his report and in particular I think we do need to look very carefully at the language we use in political debate because as we've seen tragically in the United Kingdom if the language of violence is allowed into a politics then the actions of violence will very quickly follow and I speak entirely in support of my friend and colleague from Catalonia because it dismays me that while OSCE has previously spoken about repression in Turkey, while we very nearly agreed a resolution against our hosts in Belarus last year for violations of human rights, the violation of parliamentary rights, the rights of elected politicians in Catalonia, is not being commented on anywhere. And I don't understand why parliaments and governments across Europe are so silent about this. People are put on trial for sedition and rebellion. They are put on trial. In one case, the prosecution wants somebody to go to jail for 74 years, when there is not a scrap of evidence that any of the leaders of the independence movement in Catalonia have acted violently or that they have incited violence. In fact, on numerous occasions, they have actively discourage people from using any form of violence at all. There was violence. There was exceptional brutal violence by the Spanish police, 33 of whom are now facing investigation, many hundreds more of whom would face investigation if they could be identified. Now, the question about what is the constitutional future of Catalonia is not a question for me to answer. It's not a question for OSCE to answer. We have to leave that to the people of Catalonia and their elected politicians. But the way in which this question is addressed is of fundamental importance to all of us. It is a political question, a political disagreement that must be addressed through political dialogue and when that is finished through the democratic process of giving the people a say. Our colleagues, our, former parliament, our fellow parliamentarians faced 20 years in jail because they gave the people a chance to have their say. That is all that they did. We can agree or disagree with what those politicians want to achieve, but please stand in solidarity with politicians whose only crime was to carry out the promises that they made to the people and on which they were elected by the people. The Constitution of Spain is not the master of the people. The Constitution of any democracy is a servant of the people. The police in a democracy are the servants of the people. The court system is the servant of the people. When these institutions of the state are used to deny the will of the people, then democracy is in severe danger. Please include reference to Catalonia in the report for the annual assembly this year. Thank you. Thank you. Piridaiu Slova Rasiski Diligaci Gaspadin Nikolai Brikin. Благодарю вас, госпожа председатель, уважаемые коллеги. В своем докладе господин Хаджани как бы глубоко как бы посмотрел на все эти проблемы, которые сегодня существуют значит, на пространстве ОБСН, и я думаю, что благодарен ему очень за это. Но я бы хотел вот остановиться на той тематике и проблеме, которую он озвучил. Это сегодняшний неонацизм. Современный неонацизм – это не только молодой бритоголовый юноша, выкрикивающий оскорбительные лозунги в адрес представителей различных национальностей, религиозных концепций. Многие партии, именующиеся ультраправыми право радикально представляют интересы нацистов в парламент, парламентах многих государств. И не только в Европе, практически по всему миру. Нацистская символика, нацистская литература, аудиоматериалы продолжают распространять через границы, привлекая ряды нацистского новой свежей силы. Невзирая на тот ужас, который довелось пережить нашим статистикам во время Второй мировой войны, неонацизм расцветает на просторах Восточной Европы и на постсоветском пространстве. В Литве и в Эстонии неонацистские организации пользуются по границам власти. В латвийской столице проходят марши ветеранов афнсс их сторонников. Участники с флагами Латвии и студия также Украины маршируют по центру города. Но, пожалуй, крайним проявлением неонацизма оказалась Украина. Украинские неонацисты выступают не только против России у граждан, но пытаются запретить русский язык который является родным для более чем 20 миллионов украинцев. Говоря о том, что конкретно имеется в виду по чертами неонацизма на Украине, уточняю, неонацисты абсолютно не скрывают своих позиций, они публично говорят о своей приверженности идеологии нацистов, занимается организацией нацистов. 
Все это очень хорошо известно всему миру проявления. Верховная Рада внесла поправки в закон о статусе ветерана войны, усиливающий социальную защиту участников украинских националистических организаций, в том числе запрещенной Российской Федерации Украинской Простойской Армии. Депутаты Львовского областного совета объявили 2019 год годом лидера организации украинских националистов Степана Бендера. Это, это биоживотное, которое в крови погрязло и на, ру, на руках значит, у этого человека многие жизни. Я бы просил нашего уважаемого докладчика вот, к 28 ежегодной сессии вот эту тему очень основательно включить, потому что это беда, которая сегодня стоит на пороге у ворот и у дверей наших домов. Благодарю вас за внимание. Спасибо. I now pass the floor to Mr. Hayek Konyorian from Armenia. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Hajiani for his report. Uh, it raises very important issues of human rights, which are uh, closely linked to the security. And now I would like to make a few points to the report. Firstly, the, the democratic transition of Armenia indicates that trends of overall decline of democracy and human rights in OSCE area are reversible. Uh, second, uh, one of the core tasks of the OSC to empower people of residing in conflict to enjoy their human rights and fundamental freedoms, uh, isolation and marginaliz marginalization is not root uh, to the peace. Third, we thank the reporter for his re reference to the 17th Convention of the Prevention and Punishment uh, of the Crime of Genocide. Uh, genocide prevention and remembrance uh, is important part of the OAC commitments, and we are pleased that a uh, great majority of delegations joined the initiative to com commemorate the anniversary of the delegations in Milan through joint statement. Thank you. Thank you. Now the floor goes to Mr. Yurakon Majidvoda from Tajikistan. Спасибо, уважаемый председатель Свищи. Я очень внимательно заслужил, заслушал доклад уважаемого господина Джани и немного хочу рассказать о проблем прав человека в Таджикистане. Уважаемые члены Комитета по парламентской сотрудничеству, дамы и господа, согласно Конституции Таджикистан является суверенным демократическим и правым государством. Как и в любом цивилизованном государстве, в Таджикистане закон играет важнейшую роль, где устанавливается принцип верховенства закон, права, согласно которому все сферы общественной жизни строго регламентируются законом. В Таджикистане любые ущемления прав человека недопустимо. Более того, действующие законодательства последовательно и неукоснительно обеспечивают реализацию этих прав и защищают их. Республика Таджикистан осознает важность таких ценностей, как свобода, справедливость, жизнь, благосостояние и достоинство человека. Семейные традиции, равноправие мужчин и женщин, доступ к правосудию, социальные гарантии и скорее бедности равно, как и свои международные обязательства в области прав человека. Права и свободы человека и гражданина регулируются и охраняются Конституцией, законами и признанными традиционными международными правовыми нормами. Вместе с тем, в 2016 году была подписана рамочная программа ООН по оказанию помощи в целях развития. Рамочная программа, которая наряду с другими мерами также включает вопросы верховенства закона и права человека. И он является традицией программой, привлекающей и объединяющей полный спектр экспертизы и ресурсов для предотвращения результатов в области развития в соответствии с подходом, основанным на защите прав человека. В рамках реализации проекта верховенства закона и доступ к правосудию установлена в Таджикистане платформа совместного диалога, в рамках которой обсуждаются наиболее актуальные вопросы нормотворчества, правоприменительной практики с участием министерств ведомств страны, 
судов, уполномоченных по правам человека, представитель парламента, партнеров по диалогу, а также общественной организации страны. В целях выполнения ряда рекомендаций Организации Объединенных Наций по правам человека, в части предотвращения применения пыток, а также приведения в законодательство страны в соответствии с международным стандартом, в апреле 2012 года в уголовный курс страны была внесена новая статья 143 прим под названием «Пытки», диспозиция которой полностью соответствует статье Первой конвенции против пыток и других жестоких или унижающих достоинств видов обращения и наказания. Спасибо. Спасибо. Our next and last speaker is Mr. Sebastian González de España. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta, señora Kienner. La verdad es que mi intervención estaba dirigida en un principio más al informe eh, interesante del señor Javiani, al cual suscribo perfectamente, plenamente, pero eh, después de alguna intervención que acabo de oír en relación a Cataluña no me queda más remedio que dejar clara eh, mi posición. Mi colega de la Nación Española reiteradamente viene utilizando en este foro con el único fin de intentar internacionalizar un debate y una pretensión política que a mi juicio nada tiene que ver con la realidad que aquí nos ocupa. En consecuencia, lo único que viene pretendiendo es desprestigiar nuestras instituciones democráticas. Es lamentable que se utilice este foro para desprestigiar la calidad democrática, la libertad y la defensa de derechos humanos en mi país. Afortunadamente, los parlamentarios de esta Asamblea de la OSCE conocen bien este debate y no voy a reiterar una vez más la realidad y las respuestas que venimos dando a todo lo que aquí se viene diciendo. Solo quiero reiterar una vez más que desde 1978, es decir, hace 40 años, España es un Estado social, democrático y de derecho porque así lo han querido el 90% de los españoles, entre ellos más del 95% de los ciudadanos catalanes. España es un país con los mayores estándares democráticos de libertad y de defensa de los derechos humanos. Y no lo digo yo, lo dicen las más prestigiosas organizaciones internacionales que se dedican a medir estos valores tan importantes en democracia. La mejor prueba de ello es que la señora Castel puede intervenir hoy aquí representando a una delegación española y nadie la ha coartado para ello. Esa es la mejor prueba de la calidad democrática que hay en mi país. La legislación española no existe el derecho a autodeterminación, pero sí existe un procedimiento para modificar nuestra eh, constitución y poder así acudir a la vía de la modificación legislativa para conseguir esos objetivos que algunos pretenden de independencia en parte de nuestro territorio. Ese es el camino que hay que utilizar. Por tanto, no se puede confundir y menos mezclar la pretensión de un sector minoritario en España que pretende una independencia al margen de los procedimientos legalmente establecidos. Y eso quiero reiterarlo y dejarlo muy claro en este foro. La calidad democrática en España, la libertad y los de derechos humanos se defienden en primer nivel. En España no hay presos políticos, en España hay, no hay personas que por sus ideas se les haya encarcelado. No existe eso en España. En España hay personas que han sido detenidas porque han cometido delitos. Afortunadamente, desde hace 40 años, en España no hay presos políticos. En España lo que sí que hay son personas que han, políticos, que han cometido delitos, delitos graves contra la democracia. Gracias. Rebelión, sedición y malversación. presidenta. Y uh, concluyo diciendo... I no... have to close. Gracias. Um, and I pass the floor to our rapporteur, uh, Mr. Haidiani, uh, if you have a short reaction only before we pass on the next block. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank you very much for all uh, the construct constructive remarks. Uh, we will appreciate and we will come back. And of course, there are some uh, uh, aspects of human rights that are not, uh, uh, they are divide us and not unite us. We have to use the human rights just f to unite us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Haidiani. It's now my pleasure to move on to the presentation by Ambassador Ivo Sramek, Chairperson of the Human Dimension Committee of the OSCE Permanent Council and Permanent Representative of the Czech Republic to the OSCE. Ambassador Sramek, Welcome to our commission. We have enjoyed good exchanges with your predecessors in the past, and I would like to thank you for having taken the initiative to extend your offer for cooperation also to me and the officers and leadership of our commission. The committee you chair is effectively our committee's counterpart on the governmental side of the OSCE. So it is very important for us to hear your opinions. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairperson, distinguished delegates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to address you today in my new capacity as the chairman of the Human Dimension Committee. Uh, I would also like to express uh, our appreciation of the active engagement of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly in strengthening and consolidating of democratic institutions in OSCE participating states in particular its activities in the field of election observation. And I look forward to working together with you and benefit from your experience also in the Human Dimension Committee. Protection and promotion of human rights has been a long-standing priority of the Czech foreign policy, including in the OSCE and other international fora. It's clear that the lasting security cannot be achieved without respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. And third dimension or human dimension is therefore rightfully an integral part of the OSCE comprehensive security approach. Bringing about a real change in people's lives is one of the priorities of the Slovak chairmanship and it will be also my priority and guidance in the Human Dimension Committee and will work on it in close cooperation with the Slovak Chairmanship. The bar has been set high by our British colleagues who chaired the committee in the past two years and our ambition is to keep up the high standards of the HDC work and continue to have productive and interactive discussions on topical issues. I would also like to use this opportunity to congratulate the previous Italian OSCE Chairmanship and the UK HDC Chairmanship for the excellent achievements in the human dimension in Milan. The proposed preliminary work program of the Human Dimension Committee for 2019 focuses on human rights and fundamental freedoms and includes civil and political rights economic, social, and cultural rights, and tolerance and non-discrimination. We will start our substan substantive work in the committee by addressing the topical and broad issue of participating in public and political life, as effective participation in public and political life requires an environment where all human rights are fully respected and enjoyed by all individuals. Last year's discussion on the participation of women in public and political life, as well as the publication of ODIR 
status report on the participation of Roma and Sinti in public and political life confirm that it is a topical issue on the OSCE. Apart from this, the HDC indicative work plan contains the following thematic areas tolerance and non discrimination, freedom of expression, free media and information, prevention of torture, and economic, social, and cultural rights. Taking up these topics on the HDC agenda will make it possible to follow up on the previous exchanges in the committee and other human dimension events. I, we welcome the adop adoption of the Ministerial Council decision on the safety of journalists and the decision on preventing and combating violence against women. And we would like to use the HDC platform to support their implementation. The year of 2019 is an important election year for many of us in this hall, and therefore we have decided to include the topic of elections in the HDC agenda. The topic can be approached from many different angles, for example, the implementation of uh, recommendations in report of ODIR, election observation missions, and presenting good practices in this regard. The topic of the final HDC meeting in 2019 is the 30th anniversary of the Velvet Revolution. The Velvet Revolution in the former Czechoslovakia of 1989 was a part of events and important changes in large part of the OSCE region 30 years ago. And this seemingly historical topic is still very relevant today. Important OSCE commitments and mechanisms in the human dimension were agreed and affirmed then, for example, in the Vienna document of 1989. When exploring this topic, the committee can reflect on the topical issues of the role of civil society and human rights defenders, as well as freedom of assembly and association. The indicative list of topics is neither comprehensive nor exhaustive. Some important issues will be taken up by the chairmanship. Others could be covered by joint committee meetings or be addressed at various other human dimension events during the year. Besides, my intention is to mainstream gender equality throughout all the work of the committee. Regarding working methods in the Human Dimension Committee, I would like to continue the good tradition established by the previous chairmanship. Each, me each meeting will have a thematic focus. A concept note will always be circulated to guide us through our discussions. I'll invite guest speakers, including representatives of civil society, OSC institutions, and field missions to address our meetings and inspire our deliberations. I have invited the director of ODIR and a representative on the media, on, on freedom of the media to address the committee. And I would also like to invite members of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly to some of our meetings. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador Shramik, for this, for your outline and sharing the program with us. And thanks very much for your invitation to all of us to participate actively, as actively as we can. I now um, have the pleasure to pass the floor to Director Inge Björk Solrun Kisladotter, Director of the OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, ODIR. Your input to our work in this committee is very important. We have good ties. Um, the rapporteur 
and me with Andreas Baker, our secretary, were able to share one whole day of uh, getting to know your sections, your work sections in Odir, in Warsaw. So we have a very fruitful exchange of the big work your institutions your institution is doing i would like to point out the many 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 publications you do please uh, dear member colleagues go to find them on the website of odir in Björk, you have the floor uh, thank you thank you madam chair uh, dear margaret uh, dear uh, Parliamentarians, uh, I'm going to speak here from my seat. I hope you can hear me and, and see me, although I'm, I'm sitting here. Uh, but let me start uh, by expressing my appreciation uh, for being invited to speak here today and share a few thoughts uh, with you. It is much uh, appreciated. Uh, the, uh, my presence and participation uh, here today, uh, the presence and participation of ODIR in this meeting here today, should not only be seen as a sign of the excellent cooperation we enjoy with the Parliamentary Assembly, but also an opportunity to explore new avenues for collaboration in the years to come. In recent years, I feel we have taken many positive steps towards more cooperation. It was, for instance, a pleasure to begin the year uh, by welcoming the third committee, uh, as uh, Margaret uh, uh, Chair mentioned here, and also a group of Nordic Baltic members of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly in our office in Warsaw. Uh, it gave us a great opportunity to inform uh, you, the parliamentarians, about what we are doing and hopefully also for you to get a deeper and better understanding of our work. And we are already seeing signs of concrete results from these uh, visits. Let me also use this opportunity to thank both President George Zeritelli and Secretary General Roberto Montella for very close and fruitful cooperation during my year and a half in office. Uh, maybe the, the most visible uh, uh, sign of this is the Memorandum of Understanding that we signed with the Parliament of Uzbekistan uh, in, the, uh, in the last, in the fall of last year. And uh, we, it was an uh, MOU between the Parliamentary uh, Assembly, uh, Parliament of Uzbekistan with the uh, involvement of the PA leadership, the national uh, parliamentarians in Uzbekistan and uh, ODIR, as has already been mentioned here by Svetlana Artikova in her intervention. So this is a very fruitful uh, uh, cooperation, hopefully, and uh, a signal of what we can do together. My colleagues and I have regularly and regular and fruitful discussions with the Secretary General and his staff in Copenhagen, which is something we greatly appreciate. And this weekend, I look forward to meeting and working closely with President Seretelli and a number of you during the elections in Moldova, where I will be going tomorrow morning and some of you as, as well. Uh, I very much welcome your attention to our work and hope to see that materialize in increased cooperation, contribution to our meetings and other avenues of our work and increased profile of the OSE human dimension. After all, the human dimension, sometimes said to be soft security, is anything but soft. The human dimension is about issues that are directly related to security, that are highly political and very relevant to you as parliamentarians. Here I'm not only addressing you as members of the OSE Parliamentary Assembly, but also as national legislators that can facilitate and affect the impact of our work in your countries. And I will get back to that a little later. Madam Chair, traditionally, most of the cooperation between ODIR and the OSE Parliamentary Assembly has been in the field of election observation, which continues to be a flagship activity for the OSE Parliamentary Assembly, for ODIR and the OSE in general. I see election observation as an international instrument 
that one could say serves the purpose of protecting democracy. But as challenge to democratic institutions and the integrity of elections remain, with new ones added, we can't rest on our laurels. Elections as such are generally becoming increasingly well administered and professional in the participating states. But at the same time, we see signs in some of our participating states where those who have been democratically elected undermine democratic institutions with restrictive, restrictive legislations and undemocratic practices. These tendencies should be very concerning to all those who hold dear the liberal notion of democracy that we have written in the OSCE commitments and taken for granted. Let me touch upon a few issues where I think we should aim to work together more closely. On women's participation in political life, we as OT and the Parliamentary Assembly continue to make progress together. But let's face facts. Much more work is needed. Participating states are still far from fully implementing their commitments in this regard, and it is actually troubling to witness new and worrying trends emerge, such as hate speech directed at women online. This applies in particularly to female politicians and is an ugly reminder of the challenges that new technologies pose or enable. We also need to continue efforts to ensure that human rights and fundamental freedoms are embedded in Parliament's vital oversight role of the security sector. We rely on you in this regard. Parliamentarians need to make sure that fundamental freedoms and human rights are ensured in legislation addressing threats such as violent extremism and radicalization that lead to terrorism, and here you can count on the support of ODIL. As a part of our mandate to assist participating states, my office regularly prepares legal analysis of legislations from OSCE countries, touching upon topics as diverse as political parties, freedoms of peaceful assembly and of association, the independence of the judiciary and gender equality. There is a broad variety of legislations that we have reviewed for the participating states. And I truly believe that these analyses are an excellent tool that can assist you as legislators in your home countries and would encourage you, and I would encourage you, to let your peers know about this instrument. In addition to that, my office has developed very practical tools to improve legislative processes by doing comprehensive assessments of lawmaking processes. You as parliamentarians should make use of this and allow me to remind you that as parliamentarians you can request OTIR to carry out assessments of the lawmaking processes as well as draft and existing legislations to assess their uh, compliance with OSE human dimension commitments and international human rights standards. Another area is the issue of parliamentary ethics and code of conduct. Our background study on this topic from 2013 paved the way for extensive cooperation with parliaments from various corners of our region, from participating states, and we sometimes hear that, you know, this is only something that is aimed at the countries or participating states east of Vienna, but that is not the case. It is whether they are east or west of Vienna, it doesn't matter. We work with all of them. And we have been working with countries such as Sweden, Finland, Serbia, Ukraine and Georgia on code of conduct. We are currently preparing a new edition of this study and will elaborate further on this topic. Combating intolerance and discrimination continues to be a challenge in our region, with all these efforts focusing on strongly and effectively countering hate crimes, as well as specific forms of intolerance, including racism and xenophobia, anti-Semitism and intolerance against Muslims and Christians. 
Promoting tolerance and non-discrimination are commitments that have been undertaken by all OECD participating states and therefore of all of us in this hall for a very good reason. OETIR has developed ex excellent, strong and useful tools to raise awareness about discrimination, hate crimes, anti-Semitism and other forms of intolerance, including against Muslims, Christians and members of other religions. Through advising on policy and the training of law enforcement personnel and educators, my office works to build the capacity of governments in preventing and responding to this problem and we would encourage you to make use of these tools. In this regard, I want to mention specifically the situation of Roma and Sinti. Despite some progress in the area of Roma and Sinti integration, more efforts are clearly needed for the most vulnerable and discriminated group in the OSE region. Let me just say this again, for the most vulnerable and discriminated group in the OSE region, the Roma people. Ensuring equal opportunities and assistance to overcome manifestations of racism, discrimination, violence and hate crimes against Roma, this should be given much greater attention. Political focus and efforts need to be stepped up and we need your help and commitment for this. Here I want to suggest that we explore further cooperation, in particular on Roma women's political participation and the inclusion of Roma youth. These are only few areas of OT's work in which closer cooperation with you as the OSE Parliamentarian Assembly and parliamentarians in your uh, uh, home countries would be much welcomed. Madam Chair. Last year, I mentioned in the meeting that I attended here uh, in, in Hofburg with the Parliamentary Assembly, I mentioned that we should try to examine new ways for closer cooperation. As a former parliamentarian myself, I clearly see the added value that this brings. One year later, I would argue that we have made efforts in this respect and I'm looking forward to our continuing cooperation in the coming year. It's important to remember that we are allies. Our democratic order, some of the fundamentals of the OSE commitments are increasingly being questioned and challenged. It is our joint role to safeguard the commitments, to safeguard our values. Let me finish by once again pointing out, our work with you is important to us. Whether it is you lending a public voice to our issues, sharing your experience and expertise or facilitating the work, all of it counts. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Inge Björk, for your clear words, for your strong words, for your appeals to us as MPs of all member states and also to your appeal and offer for closer co cooperation to our committee leadership. We are most glad and happy to continue our endeavors, which we have started mutually, to um, find and search more synergies out of our mutual work. And I'd like to thank you very much and your teams uh, at ODIR for the great expertise and application of scientific uh, findings that you are doing uh, as a service to us to the parliaments and to the OSCE region as a whole. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, I now open the debate on the presentation of our two last speakers, Ambassador Zamek and Director uh, Gisla Dottir from ODIR. Um, the floor goes to our first speaker, Mr. Serhi. Vizotsky from Ukraine. 
And I announce that I will close the speaker's list after three minutes. Mr. Wiesotsky, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, distinguished members. Uh, during this uh, session, I would like to speak uh, on behalf of all Ukrainians that are illegally detained and now held hostages in uh, the areas of Donetsk and Lugansk that occupied the Russian Federation or in Russian prison. As you know, uh, we made in this assembly and during the trilateral uh, meetings in Minsk uh, numerous efforts uh, to have some formats that will allow uh, the releasing of Ukrainian citizens that are now detained in the Russian Federation uh, in the occupied areas uh, at the Crimea and now in uh, the region of uh, Russian Federation itself. You all know the story of 24 Ukrainian military sailmen that were held hostage uh, in the international war by the FSB and uh, the Russian border control. They are now at Moscow and uh, they are detained and prosecuted. Although uh, we are uh, insisting that they must be released uh, and uh, uh, must be deployed to Ukraine immediately. We thank you. Uh, many of uh, the countries here in the OC region are now implying sanctions on the Russian Federation for the illegal detainees of uh, 24 Ukrainian salesmen and we thank you for that. Uh, uh, for, through the 2019, the Russian did not show any intent to demonstrate progress to release the hostages. Uh, we uh, tried to develop, uh, it means during the Minsk agreement, we tried to develop uh, numerous formats. Uh, the, the Ukrainian side proposed to free hostages held in the temporarily occupied territories of Donetsk and Lugansk specifically, even excluding the region of Moscow, of Petersburg, or uh, the Russian body itself. We tried to uh, have negotiations uh, and we uh, uh, guaranteed the pardon of 72 criminals involved uh, uh, in the separatist and Russian activities at the, the Donetsk and Lugansk region, and we wanted to negotiate with Russians on the releasing of hostages. They didn't show any respect uh, for the Minsk agreements and for this uh, kind of uh, agreements. Uh, we call the assembly uh, to press the Russian federations by additional sanctions, by resolution, by any means possible uh, to apply to the Minsk agreements. The, all of the hostages, all of the detainees must be released. Ukraine are ready to pardon all of the pro-Russian uh, and Russian military that are held now, the Russian Wagner private company members, members that are now held in our prisons, uh, all of uh, those who helped Russia uh, to occupy Donetsk and Lugansk, in order for Ukrainians to hum, come home, in order for our men, for our hostages to come home. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Pavlo Hrib, one of the uh, Ukrainians are now dying at, at prison in Russia, and uh, Ukrainian ombudsman, uh, ombudsman, ombudswoman for human rights, Lyudmila Denisova, is banned from uh, having a visit to him at Moscow. She tried to have a visit to numerous uh, hostages, but the Russian Federation denied. Please, please call on. Thank you, on Russian Federation. Thank you. Enter for Ukrainian ombudsman. Thank you. I, thank you. I now pass the floor to Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee from the United States of America. Madam Chair, thank you very much. And let me emphasize the importance of the ODIR and the General Committee on Democracy, Human Rights, and Humanitarianism uh, as relates to the OSC. Let me emphasize that uh, we as the United States delegation are here because we continue to believe in the importance of the engagement with OSCE, our European friends, and beyond. Uh, it is important as well for us to make a statement on human rights. That is the very core of our foundation in the United States, and we offer that to you in our commitment. I have said this often before, that I believe in the sovereignty of all nations, but we must consider uh, the issues of nationalism as they impact on the diminishing uh, or the questioning of human rights. Uh, to the director of the um, uh, human rights uh, uh, subcommittee, oh dear, for your grand words on dealing with uh, the questions of compliance, uh, the questions dealing with countering uh, hate crimes, if you will, uh, but more importantly, our concern for the Roma people. And I join you uh, in working or looking forward to solutions. I thank the ambassador for his excellent words as it relates to uh, the uh, issue of uh, tolerance 
versus non-tolerance and human rights. And so let me offer a perspective from the United States very quickly. Uh, this month is African American History Month in the United States. I would venture to say to you that we have months and days that honor the diversity of our nation throughout uh, the year, uh, and we've established the concept of appreciating all people. But in spite of that, and in spite of Dr. King, who many of you have heard of, Martin Luther King, uh, call for the beloved community, we have faced questions of discrimination and racism. Uh, we have faced questions of uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, I am hurt by the Nazi destruction in the uh, French uh, cemetery. Uh, just recently, we have had our incidences in Charlottesville, Virginia, where Nazis have claimed uh, have claimed uh, hatred against uh, Jews and blacks and others. And certainly, we had worshippers uh, killed not only in synagogues but in churches because of hatred. So, what does that mean? It means that we must have action over words. Uh, that is not to say that the reports have not been excellent, but I call upon my colleagues that in our respective nations we must stand actively taking the message from the OSCE uh, to ensure that it is heard, that we denounce this kind of hatred and we'll do something about it. I would ask that as we go toward July uh, that we uh, develop even stronger resolutions denouncing hate and intolerance, resolutions confirming the universal value of human life and human dignity. Uh, and uh, ensuring uh, resolutions uh, that can speak specifically to the questions of racism. We often leave that term out. So uh, we have a method and a pathway. I challenge my colleagues that we act both collectively and individually on these devastating uh, and hateful acts that have been going on around the world. I yield, Madam Chair, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. I now pass the floor to Mr. Christ Christos Dimas from Greece. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, initially, I want to thank and congratulate Kyriakos Hadzigiannis for his very systematic work and approach uh, regarding the report. Uh, I will tackle two interrelated issues that ultimately involve the entirety of human rights, migration flow and specifically the need to rethink certain issues regarding the common European asylum system and the necessity to install a comprehensive law enforcement and victim-centered framework to prevent and combat human trafficking, especially unaccompanied minors and children. In the last four years, more than 1.7 million refugees have passed to the Greek territory. It is important to note that this has occurred without incidents of violence. In fact, Greece and the Greek people have stood by the side of refugees in difficult times, providing shelter and saving thousands of lives of people that almost drowned in the sea attempting to cross into the Greek territory. A more effective and coherent common migration framework based on the notions of humanity, solidarity, and shared responsibility in order to address successfully both local and global concerns is required. In terms of welcoming and processing asylum applications, Greece has had way more than its fair share. We are the second country per capita after Cyprus and third in real numbers after Germany and France. In fact, from January 2000 until August 2018, Greece received nearly 21,000 migrants and asylum seekers, which is a 23% increase compared to 2017. Therefore, we need more equal sharing in terms of processing asylum applications. In terms of human trafficking of vulnerable categories, Greece adopts fully the principle of the best interest of the child and considers the leading principle for all policy and implementation activities involving children. More specifically, Greece is particularly concerned with the heightened vulnerability of migrant unaccompanied minors to human trafficking and takes national and international initiatives in order to protect them effectively. We have finalized our national action plan and our updated national referral mechanism. In fact, even local governments, such as the municipality of Athens, have adopted pilot pro programs aiming to protect minor, minors and children from human trafficking. 
we expect and hope that the issue will remain high on the agenda of the OSCE and all of the member states. It is not a matter of crisis management. More importantly, it's a matter of human solidarity, dignity, and human rights. And if we are, if we are here to discuss human rights, we should also be ready to protect them through our, throughout, our, throughout our coordinated actions. So now is the time to act. Thank you very much. Yes, Mrs. Gisla Dotter, I pass the floor to you for reactions, please. Well, th thank you. Uh, uh, there is not much actually to, to react to. There were, were not uh, questions, any questions uh, asked, but I just want to thank those who uh, spoke here for their interventions, and especially for mentioning maybe two issues that I didn't, you know, elaborate much on. First of all, on racism, which is a, a, a topic that we definitely need to pay more attention to, and, and thank you for... Uh, you know, denouncing hate and intolerance, uh, the, uh, rep uh, est the representative from the U.S. delegation, and also migrants and refugees. That is a topic also that is, of course, very high on the agenda and that we are all uh, very much concerned about. So thank you just for these two interventions and thank you for having me here uh, in this meeting. Thank you very much for your contributions. And now I pass the floor to Ambassador Shramik for your reactions, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just uh, would like to uh, react to the intervention of uh, uh, the Ukrainian distinguished uh, delegate, and uh, I'd like to assure him that apart from the thematic uh, approach which I uh, indicated in our uh, presentation of the work program. We, of course, uh, would uh, welcome uh, uh, the debate of actual, actual political uh, issues of relevance on our HDC meetings. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, to the distinguished U.S. delegate for uh, her kind words, and uh, I'd like to assure her that that uh, implementation and implementation phase of uh, decisions taken uh, will be will be uh, a key element of our work in the Human Dimension Dimension Committee and uh, reacting to a to, uh, uh, distinguished uh, Greek delegate uh, concerning migration. Of course, it is uh, uh, rather up uh, to the European Union the, what's uh, concerning the common EU asylum system, but, but uh, we, this is, I mean, migration and regular, irregular migration issue. Of course, this is a topic of the time. So, so we also would like to to discuss some uh, elements which are within the purview of this organization. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for your very valuable reaction. Dear colleagues, we now move on to the last block of today's committee meeting. As you saw, we put on the agenda a debate on the scope of legitimate restrictions on human rights in times of emergency. Before giving the floor to our speaker, Mr. Harlem Desir, let me share a few words with you why we chose this topic for debate. <clears throat> we all hope in our countries that circumstances requiring extraordinary powers will never occur. However, the past years have shown that in some of our member states, uh, the executive power 
has resorted to extraordinary powers of different degrees and kinds. <clears throat> it is therefore important for the leadership of this committee that we give you the materials, the backgrounds about OSCE agreements and international law which have set certain frameworks within which limitations or suspensions of civil liberties and human rights must take place. Broadly speaking, they call for any derogation of rights to be, firstly, only during a time of emergency that threatens the life of the nation. Secondly, limited strictly to the requirements of the situation and must be proportionate, principle of proportionality. Thirdly, to be consistent with other constitutional or legal obligations. And fourthly, being non-discriminatory. In addition to that, our countries have all agreed that there are no circumstances whatsoever that could justify torture. Also, importantly for our role as parliamentarians, OSCE countries have agreed to try to ensure the normal functioning of legislative bodies to the highest possible extent and in the framework of constitution. Many qu questions can remain. You will be speaking out in the debate. Uh, we have 16 speakers on the list. So, uh, Monsieur Arlem Désir, uh, je suis ravi que vous soyez venu, que vous ayez accepté notre invitation avec euh, le grand mandat que vous accomplissez au sein de notre organisation. Nous sommes vraiment très fiers et très heureux de connaître en vous une voix forte et prominente qui s'exprime régulièrement par les communiqués que nous lisons euh, à des sujets d'actualité et surtout aussi concernant les quelques pays que nous trouvons au sein de notre espace OSCE où euh, déjà il y a eu des situations de droit d'urgence. Monsieur euh, Désir, je vous passe la parole. Merci Madame la Présidente, chère Margarita, dear Ambassador Ivo Schramek, dear Rapporteur Adiani, dear Michael Link, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to address the OSC Parliamentary Assembly today on what is a, indeed a very timely and pressing subject. And I want to thank you for choosing this issue, the scope of legitimate restriction on human rights in times of emergency for our discussion today. It is a very timely one as the OSCE region is confronted with so many crises and security emergencies, including terrorist threats and attacks. Such a context, both at international and national levels in many participating states, has led governments to adopt exceptional measures of security to ensure the protections of their citizens. As parliamentarians, as legislators, you are also confronted with new phenomena which can have grave consequences, such as the dissemination of hate speech, extremist and violent content, and the manipulation of information. But as you re uh, recall, Mrs. Uh, Chair, even when justified by the seriousness of the situation, security measures must remain compatible with human rights principles and commitments of the OSC participating states. In particular, this applies to freedom of expression and freedom of the media.
Uh, the security threats in our region are numerous, and given that there is a risk that they remain a reality for long periods of time, we must be attentive that the exceptions to human rights do not become the new normal. If so, it will mean that we renounce the human dimension pillar of our comprehensive concept of security in the OSC region, and we will not reinforce the security in our region by doing so, neither in each of the participating states. In the field of freedom of expression and freedom of the media, there is a lot at stake, from access to information on the Internet, to the ability for the press to report and investigate, to free expression of views of opinion. And these are all essential, even in a time of conflict, of crisis, or of an emergency. I will be happy to elaborate on different concrete situations and cases during our discussion, as too many journalists are prosecuted, deprived of their rights, jailed, or media closed under the pretext of security. But I would like first, in the introduction, to recall some principles, as you just do. I would first recall that this topic has also deep roots in the past. It is sometimes said by historians that notions of emergency have been summoned not just in the last couple of years, but since Roman times to justify government actions which will normally not be permitted. The concept of justicium, or state of exception, was first invoked in 465 BC when Rome was gripped by panic due to a mistaken belief of imminent invasions by Aiki, which happens to be their neighbor, making it one of the most famous fake news in history. Throughout history, when states have been faced with serious challenges, such as civil war or unrest, armed conflict or natural disasters, ideas of emergency our related concepts, such as calamity and crisis, have provided the rationale for suspending the fundamental rights and freedom guaranteed under law, particularly constitutional law. Even President Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus during the Amer American Civil War. Since the early 20th century, the idea of state of emergency, in particular, has been applied across, across the world as a legal justification to limit rights in times of crisis. More recently, especially in the OSC region, states of emergency have been implemented in response to terrorist attacks, such as that which France declared after November 2015 Paris attacks, or after the coup attempt in Turkey in 2016. However, I note a contemporary phenomenon, the overuse in many countries of the term of emergency through political rhetoric conveying the impression that we are in a permanent state of emergency, even without formally or legally declaring it. The mere invocation of a state of emergency by a representative of the government or a reference to a situation of crisis should not be considered as giving governments a carte blanche to override human rights. In particular, I want to recall that international law under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR of 1966, still apply during states of emergency and determines the scope of permissible limitations on a state's human rights obligation, including with respect to freedom of expression and information rights essential for media freedom. Under international law, states have very specific and concrete human rights obligations when they wish to activate their emergency powers. First, a state may restrict certain individual rights in exceptional circumstances, but only if it has entered a valid derogation from relevant international human rights treaty provision. The ICCPR states that such exceptional circumstances may exist in a time of public emergency which threaten the life of the nation. You recall this. General appeal to an unspecified threats are they are insufficient. 
Second, only some rights can be suspended during times of emergency. International law does not permit derogation on, for instance, arbitrary killings, torture, inhuman and degrading treatments, or the suspension of freedom of thought, conscience, or religion. You will notice that freedom of expression, the basis of media freedom, can be suspended, but there are other conditions that constrain the scope of its limitations, which are defined, especially in Article 19 of ICCPR and Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights for those participating states which are uh, members of this convention. Sir, so, any emergency measure must be finite, finite, finite and temporary in nature. It cannot be permanent state of affairs. States should specifically identify any emergency measure, generally in a law, and its effect on human rights and provide reasons for the adoption. Fourth, and crucially, any emergency measure must be exceptional. It should be limited to the extent strictly required by the demand of the situation in terms of its duration, geographical coverage, and material scope. It must pass the legal threshold of legality, proportionality, and necessity. In other words, each emergency measure must be directed to an actual, clear, present, or imminent danger, as the UN Rapporteur on Counterterrorism and Human Rights underlined in our 2018 report. Fifth, any emergency measure must not be discriminatory. In other words, it should not have an adverse impact upon minorities, religious groups, or vulnerable groups, including women and children. Six, the state of emergency and the derogation should also be officially proclaimed to inform individuals subject to the change in the law affecting their rights. It must also be communicated or notified to, treaty, to the treaty representary. And seventh, there must be a genuine and robust independent oversight mechanism at the domestic and international levels. So to summarize, any emergency measure must relate to an actual emergency that is threatening the life of the nation. It must be taken in relation to a derogable right and remain exceptional, limited, temporary, and non-discriminatory, and it must be subject to a genuine oversight. Ladies and gentlemen, all these have specific meaning for freedom, freedom of expression and freedom of the media. There cannot be general restriction of this right just based on the idea of an emergency situation or on an indefinite state of emergency. And before concluding, I would like to stress that during states of emergency, the role of journalists and media organizations as public watchdogs is even more significant. Journalists and media organizations can help to spotlight precisely our emergency provisions, notably counter-terrorism measures that affect human rights, operate under emergency conditions, and whether they are in line with states' international obligation. More generally, during emergency or crisis situations, it is even more important that matters of public interest are discussed. Put differently, the free flow of information, including on issues that might have led to the actual or purported state of emergency is critical for the public's right to know and for the transparency and accountability of powerful state organs, bodies, agencies, and authorities, as well as private sector entity. For it is the public that is the ultimate check on government and the media that is critical to ensuring that the public is duly informed. As Justice Stewart of the U.S. Supreme Court wrote in 1971 in the seminal Pentagon Papers case on the relationship between national security and press freedom under the First Amendment, including in a time of war or crisis, I quote, the only effective restraint upon executive policy and power may lie in an enlightened, enlightened citizenry in an informed and critical public opinion which alone can here protect the values of democratic government. And for this reason, 
the rights and freedoms of journalists and media organizations have to be protected even during times of emergency and crisis in accordance with international law. And here, your role as national legislator is absolutely key. Free access to information, well-informed citizens, free expression of views and opinion are not detrimental to our security. Quite the contrary, I'm convinced they reinforce the resilience of societies confronted to, to security crises or emer emergency situations. As Abraham Lincoln say, let the people know the facts and the country will be safe. We could say the same of the OSC region. Let the people know the fact, let the media work, let the journalists investigate and report, let the discussion be free and open and democratic, and the region will be safer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Desir, for your clear and strong outline, especially also for having given us insight in the historic, in the history of uh, evolution of such states of emergency, legitimate or not legitimate at all. The future will always be a judge on whether in the present our executive powers our parliaments would have installed states of emergency, even um, war, uh, martial law, even martial law in conformity with the constitution of the country and all the more in conformity with international covenants that you quoted, thank you very much, and in conformity with OSC commitments. Dear colleagues, um, our Secretariat has put uh, background information uh, that I would recommend to you to look at. Uh, the background information has been circulated to you electronically in the folder. Uh, it contains the important references also uh, being given by Mr. Desir on the international covenants, on the legal framework and on the OSCE important documents on the subject. There are also copies of this background notes on the rack just outside of this room. Please uh, take the copies. Uh, they, we felt it was important to give you this background to have the sources that are relevant for our subject and for the future legislative work and for the future parliamentary oversight, which we all have to do on our executives. And I can say it because I sit on parliamentary oversight committees for a long time in a country Switzerland, which has maybe not been so problematic, but, but even then, parliamentary oversight, I can tell you, really, really, really has to be done very serious with every government, uh, spe especially then when there arises um, times of crisis uh, or even emergency. I now open the debate. Colleagues, we have 17 speakers on the list. I think time-wise we are quite in tune. Um, I will close the speakers list three minutes from now. And the floor now goes to Mr. Victor Paul Dobre from Romania. Thank you. Dear Chair, ladies and gentlemen, respect for human rights and fundamental freedom is at the core of the OSCE's comprehensive, comprehensive approach to security. Romania continues to actively support the complete Im implementation of the OSCE principle, values, and commitments. Romania has also proven its active involvement 
in the whole implementation of OCCE human dimension commitments regarding human rights, national minorities, democratization policies, policing strategies. We continue to support ODIRI's activity and we believe its standard setting and election monitoring activities are of utmost importance to the development of democratic institutions and human rights in all OCCE participating states. As to the current situation of a human dimension, Romania is a strong supporter of a continuation of the organization of early human dimension implementation meetings and of respecting their modalities. The complex phenomenon of legitimate, of legitimate restriction cannot be properly addressed in the absence of a strong and clear framework providing for the definition of emergency situations. Legal frame, uh, distinguished colleagues, legal frameworks should be designed in a manner that furthers freedom with restrictions permitted that are not beyond what is necessary in a democratic society in accordance with, with international law. Any restriction should comply with the principle of necessity, proportionality, and legal cert certainty. As representatives of our national legislative bodies, we ought to eliminate any vaguely ordered provisions in our respective national legislation that may be open to arbitrary application. Emergency situations should not be used as a pretext to restrict freedom of expression online and offline, freedom of opinion, access to information or freedom of movement, contravening OCCE commitments and international standards for the protection of human rights. To quote the OCCE representative on freedom of media, Mr. Harlem Desir, which in his regular report, the online space can only fulfill its potential for creativity exchange. Please conclude. Thank you. I now pass the floor to Mr. Alexander Vilkul from Ukraine. Большое спасибо, уважаемая госпожа председатель, уважаемые коллеги. Перед тем, как говорить о реальных проблемах, которые присутствуют в Украине с демократическими свободами и соблюдением прав человека, я хотел бы поблагодарить все институты ОБСЕ, само ОБСЕ, за ту поддержку, которую вы оказываете нашей стране, за поддержку нашей территориальной целостности, и за ту важнейшую миссию, которую сейчас выполняют ваши представители на Донбассе. Мир – это основополагающая ценность, вокруг которой объединились государства, создав ОБСЕ. Это основа Хельсинского акта. Вот сейчас мы обсуждаем ограничение прав и свобод граждан в условиях чрезвычайного положения. Это очень тонкая материя, это очень тонкий лед. И я хотел бы всем напомнить, что на востоке Украины несколько лет уже длится конфликт. Пять лет длится серьезнейший конфликт. Так вот, в течение последних этих страшных нескольких лет, вместо того, чтобы заниматься поддержкой всех тех людей, которые находятся на неподконтрольной Украине части Донбасса, как сказал предыдущий докладчик, более 500 тысяч детей страдает, страдают миллионы пенсионеров, миллионы людей. К сожалению, украинская власть организовала блокаду. И я хотел бы сейчас обратить внимание ОБСЕ, 
на необходимости дополнить вот ту резолюцию, которую мы обсуждаем. Возможно принять отдельную новую резолюцию, рассмотреть ее на летней сессии ОБСЕ о необходимости снятия блокады с Донбасса. Транспортной, экономической, энергетической и самое главное гуманитарной. Должны пойти поставки продуктов питания, должны выплачиваться пенсии, должны выплачиваться социальные э, пособия незащищенным миллионам украинских граждан. И это первый и серьезный шаг к миру. Я прошу очень серьезно рассмотреть внесение данного вопроса и в резолюцию, и разработки отдельной резолюции ОБСЕ. Я знаю, что вы поддерживаете именно такую позицию, мы много разговаривали, и вынесение рассмотрения ее на летней сессии. Спасибо. Thank you. I now pass the pass the floor to Ms. Ani Samsonian from Armenia. Thank you, dear chairwoman and colleagues. I would uh, like I would like to draw your attention to the fact that along with the improvement of information technology and web-based capabilities, the circulation of misleading usernames and fake news by their owners have become a serious issue for societies and states. This is a global challenge on the one hand to obtain, search and share information and on the other hand to realize the right of freedom to, of expression and speech. It should be noted that the presence of fake news greatly distorts democratic processes, disorient society, spreads hatred, intolerance and misleads mass media. The problem is increasing in crisis and emergency situations when people are looking for information in panic, with the risk of disorientation and wrong decision making become more actual. I must state that it results into the development of dangerous tendency. Many tend to believe that we need consistent struggle against disinformation and the state should take appropriate measures in this direction. This discourse is also available in Armenia nowadays. After the recent political developments, the Armenian society which protects the values declared by the Velvet Revolution see danger of distorting objective events, making false alarms and diminishing efforts to establish democracy in Armenia. This is especially related to the media both as a news user and news maker. At the same time, it is important to realize that the proposed fight against for fake, uh, fake news can become a tool in the hands of the government to impose restrictions on mass media and promote the establishment of censorship. This will allow officials to find legal means to interfere in the work of media, hide essential information for the public and unwanted information to the government and hug the media mission as a fourth power. The media is free Armenia now and we exert our effort, effort to avoid dangerous precedents. The mission of the OSC Parliamentary Assemblies, Committee on Democracy, Human Rights and Humanitarian Question and the OSC Observation Mission, mission is also important. I am sure we will find the best solution together. I am also glad to inform you that the newly elected National Assembly Standing Committee on Human Rights and the Public Affairs has, um, has been reopened and it is ruled by two oppositional power of Armenia in National Assembly and it is means that uh, we have um, Uh, full um, authority to oversee the work of the government and um, uh, to raise um, uh, issues related to human rights and democracy in Armenia without any constraints. Thank you. Merci. Je passe la parole à Madame Seren Moborgne de France. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Votre parole est sage et partagée par la France. Monsieur le rapporteur, monsieur l'ambassadeur, madame la directrice du BIDDH, monsieur le représentant de l'OSCE sur la liberté des médias, cher Harlem, chers compatriotes, merci pour votre propos liminaire, clair et concret que nous souhaitons universel. Le respect des droits de l'homme est l'une des conditions requises pour qualifier un état de démocratie. 
Toutefois, en certaines circonstances, un gouvernement peut décider de limiter les droits de l'homme. Évidemment, cette possibilité de limitation doit être prévue précisément par la loi ou le texte fondamental du pays au risque d'être utilisé arbitrairement. Un contrôle indépendant doit par ailleurs pouvoir s'exercer sur ces limitations. Un contrôle parlementaire ou judiciaire afin de concilier libertés individuelles et impératifs d'intérêt général. La France a récemment été confrontée à cette situation. Lorsque l'état d'urgence a été déclaré en raison des vagues d'attentats terroristes en 2015, les libertés réduites et notamment la liberté de réunion, et plus récemment, il y a quelques semaines, lorsque le Parlement français a voté une loi anti-casseurs destinée à plus sévèrement réprimer les individus qui profitaient des manifestations pour se livrer à des actes de violence gratuites sur des biens et des personnes. L'arrêté administratif peut interdire à ces personnes violentes de manifester durant un mois. Les seules exceptions susceptibles de tempérer ce principe ne peuvent être que précisément limitées dans le temps, un mois, prédéfinies en cas de violence grave et susceptibles de contrôle, par exemple par le juge qui statue en urgence et par principe. Le respect des droits de l'homme et des libertés est plus qu'un objectif, il s'agit d'un devoir et d'un impératif. À défaut, les restrictions ne sont plus légitimes et l'État n'est plus un État de droit ni une démocratie. Je vous remercie. Merci. Now I pass the floor to Ms. Bahar Muradova from Azerbaijan. Я хочу подчеркнуть, что тема повестки Дня Комитета очень актуальна для нас, учитывая то, что в многоэтническом регионе ОБСЕ нередко возникают ситуации, требующие охраны правопорядка и создания безопасности для граждан. Естественно, в этом случае возникает противоречивый момент. С одной стороны, мы декларируем всеобщую защиту прав человека, а с другой рассматриваем возможности их ограничений. Но для этого, конечно же, существует правовая база. Человеческое измерение имеет неоспоримую связь с безопасностью, стабильностью и развитием. В Хельсинском документе ОБСЕ от 2008 года подчеркивалось, что права человека, верховенство закона и демократия взаимосвязаны. Отсюда вытекает, что для общества, поставившего своей целью формирование правовой государственности, актуален вопрос о возможности и в пределах ограничений государством прав человека. А право на жизнь, право на не быть подвергнутым пыткам, нечеловеческому или принижающего человеческого достоинства обращению не может быть огранич ограничено. Однако нынешнее положение дел в этой сфере показывает, что не всегда возможно соблюдение этих прав. К сожалению, есть такое понятие, как права человека при чрезвычайном положении. Права людей, живущих в приграничных районах и на линии соприкосновения находятся в опасности, не говоря уже об опасности, грозящих их жизни. Проблемы беженцев и вынужденных переселенцев мне очень близки, потому что линия соприкосновения, разделяющая мою страну на две части, проходит через середину моего избирательного округа. Таким образом, жизнь людей, женщин, детей, стариков, живущих в таких районах в условиях, аналогичных чрезвычайному положению, находится в серьезной опасности. Поэтому мы должны обратить внимание на гарантии того, чтобы такие люди могли жить в безопасности и без страха. Надо уделить особое к ним внимание. Поэтому грань ограничения прав человека со стороны государства должна быть адекватной, требованием чрезвычайной ситуации и должна быть мерой крайней необходимости. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you. I now pass the floor to Ms. Ayla Paloniemi from Finland. Mrs. Chair, dear colleagues, I would like to focus on the right and access to information. This information and propaganda are by no means new phenomena, but the ways in which they are spread have become more sophisticated because of the Internet and the increasing role of social media as people's first source of information. Special attention should be given to the new 
threats to elections and the election process. Evidence show that already now fake news has had an impact on election results. If we do not take affirmative action against it, fake news and disinformation will seriously damage our societies. As a journalist, I am well aware of the many obligations designed to ensure balanced and unbiased reporting by professional media. At the same time, media's task is also to question our statements and our opinions in order to allow the people to make an informed choice before the elections. However, in many countries, social media are not subject to these same rules. This allows for autocratic regimes, interest groups and other wrongdoers to abuse the system in order to spread their own malevolent messages and news. The ultimate aim being to create divisions and tensions in our societies. So, what should we do to counter fake news and disinformation? The trolls and propagandists seem to always uh, be one step ahead. Demanding our governments to improve regulation is one important aspect, but not enough. We must guarantee editorial independence of public service media and ensure that media is free from pressure by governments or other interest groups. We also must establish clear legal liability on social media platforms when publishing illegal, unfruitful and harmful content. However, I think the most important thing we can do is to ensure that people are well informed of this challenge and are given the tools they need to strengthen their critical thinking and media literacy. I call on each one of us to stop ourselves from reading and spreading falsehoods and expose those who are trying to harm our societies and us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Ms. Margareta Sederfeld from Sweden. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would also like to congratulate the uh, Rapporteur, Mr. Kyriakos Haviani, for his report. And uh, thanks also to Ambassador Ivis Remick, as well as uh, Ms. Ingbjörg Solon Gisladotter for their presentations. Uh, and uh, when it comes to this part of the debate, I, I also would like to say that the report by Mr. Hallam this year is uh, very important. Free media goes hand in hand with a free and democratic uh, society and is a part of human rights. And if there is no free media, it's also very difficult for uh, minorities to raise the voice. And in this perspective, I would like to say that uh, over the past years, we have re received increasingly worrying reports of human rights violation from the Chechenian Republic of the Russian Federation. LGBT people in particular have been systematically persecuted, unlawfully detained, tortured, made to disappear and killed. This was mentioned in paragraph 13 of the resolution of violations of human rights and fundamental freedom in the Russian Federation in the Berlin Declaration. The allegations were recently confirmed by an investigation by the OSCE rapporteur. Despite attempts from regional and federal human rights institutions, no progress has been made to remedy the situation for the victims or to hold those responsible for these human rights violations accountable. This calls for action from the OSCE to protect the rights and freedoms of individuals in the Chechen Republic and ensure the rule of law. The persecution of LGBT people is taking place in a context of increase, increasing state oppression when human rights monitors have been forced to leave the Chechen Republic due to threats and harassment. It is urgent that this development is halted and reversed. Uh, Madam Chairperson, it's our uh, 
commitment as members of our OSCE uh, Parliament PA to stand up for human rights and stand up for the LGBT people in the OSCE region. And we should use the whole OSCE portfolio to change the situation. For example, send an OSCE delegation to Chechenia. I would also say refer to the Klausul 152 from the Minsk Declaration, which says uh, there should be a support and secure for the LGBT person's right, or why not uh, uh, try Please. to work together with Thank human you. rights organization institutions like the Ombudsman in the Moscow. There is several things we can do. And I say this Thank because you. this is related. Thank you. I pass the floor to Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee from the United States of America. Madam Chair, thank you very much. And if I might, with respect, Mr. Desir, say to you, merci beaucoup. Very excellent uh, report. And it is absolutely true that uh, the Parliament uh, and the Congress must be enthusiastically supportive of the idea of the freedoms that may be annihilated, annihilated excuse me, uh, as it relates to emergency declaration, and no nation is immune. Let me thank you for citing Abraham Lincoln. This is the month of his birthday, uh, and I repeat, let the people know the facts and the nation will be safe. That is so true. The right to freedom of expression is particularly subject to abuse and undue restriction in states of emergency. A state of emergency is not a free pass to dismantle a free press, but I want to emphasize after the state of emergency allegedly uh, is nullified and the actions still continue. We must be vigilant and diligent to continue our review. Uh, for example, obviously uh, the killing of Mr. Kasagi, a media uh, person who had status in the United States, not really subject to a emergency declaration, but sadly lost his life because of a difference of opinion. We must be constant in our review as it relates to that. I also want to make mention of the fact that the state of emergency ending in Turkey did not stop them holding Metin Taupus, an employee of the U.S. Consulate in Istanbul, for 15 months without charges. In addition, the end of the state of emergency brought no relief to American physicist Serkan Gulge. Uh, and the United States unequivocally stands behind the innocence of Metin Tupaz uh, and as well uh, his colleague Meet Kunturk and of course the physicist Dr. Google. We must understand the importance of freedom and freedom of press, freedom of religion for Jews, Muslims, Christians and all others. Uh, we take issue with Andrew Brunson who was also in the custody wrongfully in Turkey. We want our friends to recognize in Turkey that we look for uh, the encouragement and the changes that need to be made. But we have to speak out. We must talk about these unfortunate circumstances. We must include in that academic freedom. Cooperation exchanges in the field of education is one of the foundational elements of the Helsinki Final Act. Regrettably, academic freedom is under threat in some participating states through a variety of means. And certainly that is sad uh, as it relates to an academician uh, that was jailed for signing an online petition in Turkey. Again, freedom of religion must be emphasized. All human rights and fundamental freedoms are at risk in times of real or stated emergency. Freedom of religion is an example. The governments of some participating states regularly invoke security when they violate freedom of religion uh, and break their OSCE commitments to recognize that. Again, I call upon my colleagues not only to speak, but to act, safeguard in times of declaration of emergency and at all other times. I yield back. I thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. I now pass the floor to Ms. Jagoda Shapaska from North Macedonia. Thank you, Margareta. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, the topic of today's debate is currently a very important issue within the participating states of OSCE. Dear colleagues, at this winter session, it is for the first time that our delegation participate under the name Republic of North Macedonia. 
This is the result of the constitutional changes based on the principal agreement that we signed with the Republic of Greece, which put an end to the almost 30-year-old dispute over the name of our country, a dispute that has been a major obstacle to our strategic commitments to EU and NATO membership. Today I am pleased to inform you that we have signed the accession protocol for NATO membership and it has already been ratified in several parliaments of the member states of the Alliance. We expect to finally get a date for the start of the accession negotiations with the European Union this year, having been a candidate for membership to, since 2005. Ladies and gentlemen, in the past years, my country was not immune to the events in which human rights in state of emergency was questioned. The memories of 27 April 2017 are still fresh when the violent entry into the assembly took place whilst the elected representatives were attacked and the constitutional order of the state was endangered. However, we decided to give reconciliation a chance because it was necessary for the strategic commitments of our country, the EU and NATO integration, the reforms that are ahead of us and above all the prevention of possible political crises or weaknesses of the system. For that purpose, an inter-party parliamentary group for a reconciliation and integration was formed in the Assembly. Dear colleagues, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states the recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world. The constitution of my country regulates this issue but by defining a state of war and a state of emergency whilst precisely defining the obligation and duties of the parliament. Every country, when creating its own policy, should, should respect the international norms prescribed by international trade, such as the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental uh, Freedom. According to this international document, certain human rights are not derogated in any circumstances. The right of life, the prohibition of torture, the prohibition of slavery, human treatment of all persons deprived of liberty, the prohibition of hostage taking and unfold confinement and other. Hence the role of the OSC as an important regional organization that acts it's not only to area of security, arms control, trust and security, but also respect for human rights Please and freedoms. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Алексей Корненко. Благодарю вас. Уважаемые коллеги, ситуация после государственного переворота на Украине настолько быстро меняется от плохого к худшему, а преступления и тотальное беззаконие киевской хунты достигают таких масштабов, что не замечать всего этого не могут даже международные организации в частности. На Украине продолжается борьба с инакомыслием, Преследованию подвергаются журналисты и СМИ, которые осмеливаются высказывать альтернативную кинской пропаганде точку зрения на происходящее в стране. Эксперты ООН констатируют, что такие нападения становятся все более открытыми и подпитывают нетерпимость и дискриминацию. По данным мониторинговой миссии ООН по правам человека на Украине с августа по ноябрь 2018 года, количество нападений на журналистов возрасто на треть. За последние пять лет на Украине были убиты не менее 18 сотрудников СМИ, из которых шесть были гражданами России. Преступления до сих пор не расследованы. В очередной раз продлен срок содержания по страже главного редактора РИА Новости Украина Константина Вышинскому, который был арестован в мае прошлого года по надуманному обвинению в госизмене, а на деле за свои журналистские взгляды. Несмотря на наши неоднократные призывы к США и ЕС повлиять на своих украинских подопечных, мы не увидели какой-либо публич... публичной реакции на арест Вышинского. Под удар попадают и украинские правозащитники. По данным Amnesty International и Human Rights Watch, с начала 2018 года на Украине было совершено более 50 преступлений против гражданских активистов, осмелившихся критиковать действия властей, и приводящих антикоррупционные расследования в отношении них. Антисемитизм 
и проявление нетерпимости в отношении представителей других национальных меньшинств приобрело вопиющие масштабы. После государственного переворота в феврале 2014 года на Украине усилились позиции радикальных националистических сил, которые стали открыто проповедовать идею этнической нетерпимости, включая и антисемитизм. Политика героизации таких исторических личностей, как Бандера, Шухевич и других, и возведение их в ранг национальных ориентиров приводит к росту наци нацистских идей и антисемитизму. По оценке израильских экспертов, Украина занимает лидирующие позиции в Европе по инцидентам на почве антисемитизма. Агрессивные действия националистов направлены и на представителей иных национальных меньшинств – венгров, ромов. Так, в 2018 году радикалы неоднократно э, по абсолюту, при абсолютном бездействии со стороны полиции нападали на ромов, сжигали их имущество и личные вещи. В общем, текущий год будет очень сложным для жителей Украины, которые критикуют власть. Уверен, что парламентская ассамблея ОБСЕ способна повлиять на выполнение Украины Минского договора и соблюдение прав и основных свобод граждан. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо. I pass the floor to Mr. Zoltan Fenivezi from Hungary. Sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin, meine Damen und Herren, es bleibt eine traurige Tatsache, dass die Spannungen zwischen den ethnischen Gruppen nach wie vor eine ständige Quelle von Konflikten im Konflikt in und um die Ukraine sind. Wir glauben weiterhin daran, dass internationale Verpflichtungen im Bereich des Schutzes der Grundrechte Mindeststandards sind. Die teilnehmenden Staaten sollten auch Empfehlungen verschiedener internationaler Gremien befolgen, wie den hohen Kommissar der OSCE für nationale Minderheiten oder der Parlamentarischen Versammlung des Europarates und der Venedig-Kommission. Wir sind an einer demokratischen, politisch und wirtschaftlich stabilen Ukraine interessiert, die sich verpflichtet, ihre Form zu befolgen und sich auf einen europäischen Integrationsfund einzulassen. Im Hinblick auf den allgemeinen Grundsatz des Schutzes nationaler Minderheiten halten wir es für sehr wichtig, sowohl die individuelle als auch die kollektive Identität nationaler Minderheiten zu wahren, sowie die freie und autonome Ausübung ihrer kulturellen, erzieherischen und sprachlichen Rechte zu wahren. In diesem Sinne haben wir in den letzten vier Jahren den Transkarpaten Ungarn und der Ukraine unabhängig von der ethnischen Herkunft und der Nationalität 30,3 Milliarden Forint zur Verfügung gestellt. Wir haben das Land mit Bildungs-, Gesundheits-, Kultur-, Kirchen-, Sozial- und Talentenbetreuungsprogrammen wirtschaftlichen Entwicklungsprojekten, Nahrungsmitteln, Krankenhausausstattung, Medikamenten und Impfstoffen unterstützt. Die Integration nationaler Minderheiten trägt zur Aufrechterhaltung von Frieden und Stabilität bei. Diese Integration kann jedoch zu Assimilation führen, ohne dass kollektive Rechte gewährleistet werden. Wir halten es daher für absolut notwendig, die kollektive Identität zu schützen und kollektive Rechte zu gewährleisten, deren Beispiele in Europa zahlreich sind. Wir halten es für wichtig, dass die Mitgliedstaaten der OSCE ihre Bemühungen und die Einhaltungen der internationalen Verpflichtungen zum Schutz nationaler Minderheiten fortsetzen, wobei neue Gesetze die bereits erworbenen Rechte nationaler Minderheiten uneingeschränkt respektiert müssen. Danke für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Thank you. And I pass the floor to Mr. Branimir Jovanovic from Serbia. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, for the democratic development of every society, the area of freedom of the media is very important. I know very well how important it is for journalists to work without fear that anyone will attack them, because I was working as a journalist for about five years. 
Journalists have the right to investigate, to express their views, and therefore not to be under pressure or attacked because of their reports. That is why it is necessary to continuously work on creating an environment in which media freedom is very guaranteed, in which journalists will report without fear. When I talk about media, I must point out that we should not allow the right to information to be denied to people. Unfortunately, at the end of last year, provisional institutions in Pristina imposed tariffs on all products coming to Kosovo from central Serbia. Because of such rigorous measures, the Serbs in Kosovo and Metohija don't have the opportunity to buy newspapers that were coming from central Serbia almost until recently. In this way, they are denied the right to be informed. It is therefore important that provisional institutions in Pristina abolish these inhuman measures and continue the dialogue between representatives of Belgrade and Pristina. In the report of Mr. Halim Desir of 22nd November 2018 on the freedom of the media problems of journalists from the local portal Zhig in Serbia were reported. Unfortunately, two months ago there was another attack on a journalist of this portal. But we are encouraged that the police subsequently arrested the attackers and recently the order was also arrested. In this way, our government has sent a clear message that it will not tolerate violence and pressure on journalists. We are ready to work on creating better conditions for the work of journalists in the future. And then, when we achieve the necessary standard in the area of media freedom, we must not stop. We must not forget that this is a sensitive, that this is a sensitive area. Freedom of the media is of great importance for every democracy. And in Serbia, we want to encourage political dialogue and debate of different attitudes. I hope that in the upcoming period, we will achieve better results in the field of media freedom. Thank you. Thank you. And I now pass the floor to Lord Dubs from the United Kingdom. Thank you, thank you, Chair. May I first congratulate Mr. Desir for an excellent presentation. I think we should all take it to heart, take it back to our countries, and, and, and push our governments on the lines you've talked about. I do think it's important that when there are emergency measures, Parliament should be able to scrutinize them properly. Governments say, we've got to do this quickly. That's not good enough. I, I believe that all parliaments should have the ability to scrutinize their governments on an ongoing basis about the standard of human rights that's being pra practiced. Because governments all too often say, the state of emergency is so urgent, we haven't got time to debate it. That is wrong. We must also, I agree, make sure that public opinion is informed and public opinion is on our side. Because if governments simply develop a state of hysteria and then say it's got to be done urgently, the public are shut out. It's important the public are brought with them and the Parliament has a responsibility for that. I'm very concerned about the use by some governments of detention. Detention is, is a total denial of human rights and it shouldn't be used arbitrarily, it should be subject to proper legal and judicial processes. We have had a number of examples in the UK, I'm going to mention them, I know it's not fashionable to criticise one's own government here, but I, we're not we're not here to speak for our government, we're here to be par as parliamentarians. We've had the incident of the woman who married a jihadi and wants to come back from Syria. And our government has said she's not going to be allowed to return. I think that is quite unacceptable. She is, she was born in Britain, she had an education in Britain. There's no argument at all that she should be denied a chance to return to Britain. Of course she should be prosecuted if she's broken the law. Of course that should happen, but she has come to Britain as she's asked to do. It's not right for our Home Secretary to say she's not going to be allowed back. That is, that is a breach. Uh, secondly, um, um, we, we, we've had a bit of hysteria about some Iranian people who crossed the channel and our government said uh, there's almost a state of emergency because 80 people came across in dinghies. That's not a state of emergency. We even withdrew a ship from the Mediterranean to stop them. I mean, that's just, that is just absurd. And we only have to look at the history of Britain in Northern Ireland over the years until the Good Friday Agreement to show that when human rights are given second place, 
awful things happen and that does not protect anybody and, and our history in Northern Ireland should be a lesson to other countries as how not to do it. We've got the Good Friday Agreement now, we've turned the corner but it's important we remember the lessons. Just one other point and that is the use of electronic media. I am concerned that they are not subject to the normal legal processes. We do have to be careful. All sorts of abuses take place on the electronic media, abuses of individuals, hate crime and so on. We have to balance that against the need to protect people from hate crime. So we do have to look at the electronic media. But Mr. Desir, well done. Thank you. Thank you. I pass the floor to Mr. Anton Heroshenko from Ukraine. Спасибо за возможность высказать свою позицию. Хочу сказать в очередной раз, что Российская Федерация продолжает нарушение прав человека на оккупированной территории Украины в Крыму и на оккупированной территории государства Украина на Донбассе. Не дают возможности выступать тем гражданам и журналистам, которые хотят рассказывать правду о нападении России на Украину. Журналисты, которые говорят правду, размещаются по тюрьмам. Например, в Крыму было осужден на два с половиной года лишения свободы и на два года лишения заниматься журналистской деятельности украинский журналист Николай Семена. К 12 годам тюрьмы приговорен украинский журналист Роман Сущенко. Таким образом, не дают возможности реализовывать права вывозные всеобщей декларации человека на свободу слова, свободу журналистской деятельности. Продолжается нарушение 20 статьи Всемирной конвенции прав человека Российской Федерации это право на свободную работу общественных и политических организаций, выражение свободы своего мнения. Запрещена общественная организация крымских татар Меджилис. Это является доказательством того, что в России не уважаются права человека. Относительно убийств журналистов, то Россия, по мнению Международного комитета по защите журналистов. По глобальному индексу безнаказанности убийства журналистов занимает девятое место среди таких стран, как Сомали, таких стран, как Ирак, Сирия, Южный Судан, Мексика. Остается констатировать факт, что Российская Федерация и руководство не уважают Декларацию прав человека, не уважают права собственного народа. И в завершение хочу еще раз напомнить, что в конце ноября прошлого года российские вооруженные силы и пограничники в нарушение всех прав пиратским методом захватили в плен три украинских корабля, 24 украинских моряка незаконно удерживаются на территории Российской Федерации. Помните, уважаемые коллеги, что же самое может произойти с вашей страной, если вы будете переходить дорогу интересам российского агрессора. Thank you. And now I pass the floor to Mr. Tahir Mirkishili from Azerbaijan. You are the last speaker. Afterwards we will hear the reaction from uh, Monsieur Arlem Desir. You have the floor. Thanks a lot, Madam Chair. Uh, the topic is very interesting. I want also to pass my ideas also. So it's universally acknowledged that the right to freedom of expression is a foundational human right of the greatest importance. It's a linchpin of democracy, key to the protection of all human rights, and fundamental to human dignity in its own acts. At the same time, it's also universally recognized that it's not an absolute right. And every democracy has developed some system to limitation on freedom of expressions. The security of the state and its democratic institutions and the safety of its official and its population are vital public and private interests that deserve protection if necessary at high cost even. So in fact, those who commit or plan terrorist acts often abuse their human rights and freedoms to plot these acts. There are different conventions indicating that the rights and freedoms of anybody, even potential victims of terrorist acts, may be restricted in the interest of national security and public safety. The justification of limitation depends on a number of facts, actually. First of all, the limitation must be prescribed by law, which requires the regulation in transparent and accessible legal provisions. And then the limitation must be necessary in a democratic society, actually. There are external facts also that causing limitation of rights to the life. For example, aggression to the neighbor country or occupation of the territory, 
such facts are depriving the people of the right to life, which we observe in Azerbaijan regarding to the refugees that became because of the conflicts. It's clear that the balance that has to be struck between national security and public safety, on the one hand, and the enjoyment of the fundamental rights and the freedoms, on the other hand, cannot be determined by use any mathematical calculation of fixed scales. The criteria by which to make the balance and the way to be attributed to the various elements may vary at different times and in different contexts. At the end, I want just to be clear that it's very clear that to eliminate the reasons will make a necessity to limit the human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Monsieur Désir, je vous passe la parole pour répondre à quelques questions et pour nous faire part de vos remarques finales. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Je, je ne pourrais probablement pas répondre à toutes les questions ou tous les sujets qui ont été soulevés parce que euh, certains ne relevaient pas directement de mon, de mon mandat ou de mon champ d'action, mais je pense que euh, certains de ces euh, points seront évidemment transmis euh, à la directrice du Bureau des institutions démocratiques et des droits de l'homme et euh, je veux remercier tous les intervenants pour leur contribution à ce débat. Euh, je veux remercier d'abord le premier intervenant de la Roumanie pour, pour son soutien à mon travail et à la dimension humaine de l'OSCE. L'intervenant de l'Ukraine ensuite a mentionné la situation du conflit dans l'est du pays. Mais là, je pense qu'il n'y avait pas de question particulière qui m'était adressée. Je veux simplement dire que j'ai eu à intervenir plusieurs reprises concernant des journalistes, je pense notamment à l'un d'entre eux, Stanislas Asiev, qui est détenu dans cette région, sans d'ailleurs qu'il n'y ait eu évidemment de procès et de possibilité pour lui de, de se défendre. Et nous sommes très inquiets et nous, nous avons demandé à ce que tous ceux qui peuvent avoir une influence agissent pour sa, pour sa libération. La députée de, de l'Arménie a rappelé le, le contexte politique nouveau dans le pays après euh, la révolution de, de velours et euh, l'importance de la liberté des médias dans, dans, dans cette nouvelle situation. J'ai eu l'occasion moi-même de me rendre euh, en Arménie en octobre dernier, d'y rencontrer le, le Premier ministre Nicole Pachignan, d'évoquer ces sujets avec lui. Et vous avez aussi mentionné le problème des fausses informations, des fake news, euh, l'impact négatif qu'elles peuvent avoir sur le procès sur le processus démocratique et c'est une, une question qui a été mentionnée par d'autres intervenants. Et il y a effectivement des risques face à euh, ces phénomènes qui se développent sur les, les réseaux sociaux que des, des mesures de restriction excessives soient mises en place qui pourraient finalement euh, déboucher sur une sorte de nouvelle censure. Et je pense que c'est extrêmement important tout à la fois d'être conscient des problèmes que cela peut poser, parfois de manipulation de l'information qui peuvent déstabiliser des euh, débats démocratiques, mais en même temps d'y répondre d'une façon appropriée en soutenant les journalistes professionnels qui essayent euh, d'assurer une information de qualité, euh, en encourageant les initiatives par exemple de fact-checking qui se sont beaucoup développées ces dernières années, en développant aussi l'éducation aux médias, media literacy comme on dit dans toutes les langues aujourd'hui, euh, et en développant l'esprit critique des utilisateurs face euh, au risque que des fausses nouvelles ou des, des discours de haine n'enflamment euh, les esprits. Et c'est davantage dans cette direction que dans, dans, dans la direction d'une censure ou d'une restriction euh, de l'information qu'il faut travailler. Bien sûr, euh, les règles qui s'appliquent aux restrictions à la liberté d'expression euh, en général s'appliquent aussi en ligne et sur Internet. Et donc les discours euh, racistes, les appels à la violence, euh, les, les discours antisémites doivent être combattus et peuvent justifier des limitations, des restrictions. C'est l'objet de beaucoup de projets de loi ou de législation qui sont discutés dans vos parlements. Mais je veux évidemment ici insister auprès de vous, les législateurs, sur l'importance de l'équilibre entre la protection de la liberté 
d'expression qui doit rester la règle et les restrictions qui doivent être des exceptions. Je veux remercier euh, la députée euh, Sereine Mauborgne, euh, chère Sereine, pour euh, son soutien et pour avoir euh, mentionné la situation à laquelle la France a été confrontée après des attentats terroristes ou des actes violents dans des manifestations. Ce que je voudrais souligner, c'est que dans le cas de l'état d'urgence en France, il n'a pas, il n'y a pas eu d'effet sur la liberté d'expression et la liberté des médias. Et je pense que c'est un point extrêmement important. Je ne veux pas revenir sur les autres aspects qui euh, ne concernent pas directement la question de la presse ou de la liberté d'expression, mais euh, je pense que c'est un point qui pourrait être retenu dans beaucoup d'autres situations. Il y a parfois des mesures particulières qui doivent être prises, mais on, on devrait exclure la question de la presse, des médias et de la liberté d'expression, des mesures qui sont liées à la lutte contre le terrorisme, parce qu'en réalité, euh, à part euh, la propagande terroriste elle-même, euh, des vidéos de Daesh par exemple, etc., sur lesquelles il y a un consensus euh, très large, on ne voit pas de raison pour lesquelles la lutte contre le terrorisme justifierait des restrictions à l'activité des journalistes et à la liberté euh, de la presse. Euh, concernant euh, la situation en Azerbaïdjan, il y a eu plusieurs interventions. La première euh, ne concernait pas spécifiquement la situation des médias, mais les populations qui sont proches de la ligne de démarcation. Donc je, je reviendrai tout à l'heure sur les autres aspects. Euh, la députée de la Finlande a euh, aussi manifesté un soutien. Je veux la remercier et insister sur euh, les droits à l'accès à l'information, sur euh, la question des fake news et sur l'éducation aux médias. Et je pense qu'effectivement, c'était euh, tout à fait nécessaire de le rappeler. Je veux aussi re remercier euh, la députée euh, de la Suède qui, qui a fait le lien avec euh, la situation des minorités et des groupes qui doivent pouvoir avoir un accès libre aux médias. Euh, je veux dire merci aussi à euh, Sheila Jackson Lee, euh, même si elle a dû nous quitter euh, du Congrès des États-Unis. Euh, elle a mentionné aussi l'assassinat de M. Khashoggi, la situation euh, en Turquie, et c'est effectivement une situation qui nous a amené à, à intervenir euh, à la fois sur euh, euh, l'assassinat de M. Khashoggi et la nécessité d'une clarification et d'une enquête internationale euh, après ce crime odieux, euh, mais qui n'a pas été commis par un État participant euh, de l'OSCE, donc nous n'avons pas pu euh, intervenir euh, évidemment directement auprès des responsables, mais nous avons soutenu euh, la Turquie dans, dans son, son action pour obtenir euh, toute la vérité sur euh, ces faits. Dans le même temps, je veux dire aussi que nous avons avec la Turquie des échanges euh, sur des situations internes euh, au pays. Et malheureusement, un très grand nombre de journalistes, vous le voyez dans mes rapports au, au Conseil permanent, qui sont poursuivis ou qui sont emprisonnés, selon nous, de façon euh, injustifiée. Et j'espère, même si nous avons tous compris les circonstances euh, de la mise en place de l'état d'urgence après la tentative de coup d'État en juillet 2016, qu'il euh, sera possible de retourner à l'application des engagements euh, internationaux, euh, notamment au sein de l'OSCE de la Turquie, concernant la la liberté des médias pour tous les journalistes qui sont concernés. Euh, je veux, pour euh, la députée de euh, euh, la Macédoine du Nord, la République de Macédoine du Nord, simplement parce qu'elle n'a pas évoqué particulièrement la question des médias, même si nous travaillons beaucoup euh, en ce moment avec le gouvernement et le Parlement sur différentes réformes, notamment dans le domaine des services publics de l'audiovisuel, mais la félicité pour euh, l'accord de, de Prespa et euh, pour euh, pouvoir donc pour la première fois intervenir ici en tant que euh, représentante de la République de Macédoine euh, du Nord. Euh, le député de, de Russie est intervenu sur euh, à la fois le problème très grave de l'impunité des crimes commis contre des journalistes et il est vrai que dans de trop nombreux pays, euh, il y a eu des assassinats de journalistes qui n'ont pas été élucidés. Nous avons, euh, il y a quelques mois, organisé une conférence sur euh, euh, l'ensemble de ces, de ces situations et avec l'Université de Vienne euh, et l'aide des États participants, nous avons euh, essayé de savoir quels étaient les crimes pour lesquels les coupables, à la fois les, les, les meurtriers, mais aussi les, les, les masterminds, les, les donneurs d'ordre, ceux qui étaient derrière ces assassins, avaient été identifiés, et les, et les cas dans lesquels il y avait malheureusement une impunité totale ou partielle. Et au cours des 25 dernières années, sur 400 cas de journalistes qui ont été tués, dans 85% des cas, 
il y a euh, une situation d'impunité. Et malheureusement, vous savez que nous euh, célébrons aujourd'hui le premier anniversaire de l'assassinat d'un jeune journaliste, Jan Kuciak, euh, en Slovaquie. Nous avons publié un, un communiqué avec le, euh, le président en exercice, euh, Miroslav Lachak, pour euh, demander que, que euh, même si déjà plusieurs des meurtriers ont été arrêtés, tous euh, ceux qui sont impliqués dans ce crime soient euh, arrêtés, soient inculpés et, et est à rendre compte devant la justice. Euh, le début le député a aussi évoqué la situation d'un journaliste de l'agence Ria Novosti, Kyle Wyszynski, qui est détenu actuellement en Ukraine. Et j'ai eu à demander la libération de, de ce journaliste, comme euh, je suis intervenu pour demander euh, la libération aussi d'un autre journaliste ukrainien, celui-là, euh, celui-ci, Roman Sushenko, qui est détenu en Russie. Et, et j'espère que tous les efforts euh, et que tous les gestes de bonne volonté seront déployé au cours des prochains temps pour permettre que ce type de situation, notamment pour ces deux journalistes, mais aussi pour d'autres, euh, soit résolu. Euh, le député de, de, la, de la Hongrie est euh, intervenu sur euh, des problèmes de, de traitement des minorités nationales en Ukraine, mais il n'y avait pas de référence à la situation des médias. Euh, député de, de Serbie a évoqué la situation des médias euh, en Serbie, et notamment euh, l'arrestation euh, des auteurs d'une attaque contre le journaliste Milan euh, Jovanovic et ça a été effectivement un, un événement très important parce que ces attaques ne peuvent pas rester impunies et là il y avait euh, une tentative d'assassinat peut-être, en tout cas l'incendie de sa maison et euh, en ce moment nous travaillons d'une façon plus large en Serbie avec le gouvernement et l'ensemble des associations de journalistes et de médias sur une révision de la stratégie des médias et euh, de toutes les législations et les politiques qui peuvent concourir à la fois à la sécurité des journalistes, mais aussi au pluralisme des médias et à la diversité euh, des médias. Concernant les droits de douane qui ont été imposés à des importations de, de journaux euh, au Kosovo, euh, de journaux serbes, c'est un sujet que, sur lequel je suis intervenu et euh, dont j'espère qu'il trouvera rapidement une solution. Il se trouve que je serai au Kosovo pour l'évoquer, ce sujet, ainsi que d'autres, euh, la semaine prochaine. Je veux remercier euh, Lord Alf Dubs. I want to, to thank you, uh, Lord, for your intervention and, and your support. And I, I fully agree on what you underline, the need for Parliament to have the ability to scrutinize a state of emergency uh, and even to scrutinize any kind of uh, uh, measure linked to the fight against uh, terrorism, or to uh, security uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, it was also said by uh, Sheila Jackson Lee that this scrutinization is needed not only during the, the uh, specific state of emergency, but uh, every time. And uh, that was also a point that was uh, underlined by the, the French uh, Member of Parliament, because the Parliament has a specific role in uh, the, the scrutiny of the state of emergency in France, uh, which, by the way, is now uh, finished. Um, you mentioned abuse of uh, detention. Uh, it concerns also a lot of journalists and media actors in, uh, in several countries of the OSC, and have raised this issue uh, very often. Uh, a, a parliamentarian of uh, Ukraine uh, recalls the situation of uh, Roman Sushenko, which I'll, I have uh, already uh, mentioned. And the last uh, speaker was a, a member of parliament of uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, of course, you recall that in international law, there is a possibility of limitation of freedom of expression, and that has been the whole uh, uh, set of our discussion to uh, look at this. But what I will say is that there should be limit to the limitation. And that the problem is when limitation uh, becomes a general situation. And, and I, I will really encourage uh, your parliament uh, as uh, uh, other participating states to look at uh, changing uh, this situation when it happens and to consider that it's only, as you, you recall it, when there is a major risk on the survivance of the nation itself that you can, for a temporary time, have some kind of restrictions in all the uh, legal conditions and international conditions that you, you have recall. But uh, those situations 
Uh, of course, there is always security uh, issues uh, in all of our region and in many of our countries at all time. But this cannot justify permanent restrictions to freedom of expression and freedom uh, of the media. And that, that's the very important aspect of this uh, uh, debate that I, I would like us to, uh, to, to keep. It is that there should not be a general opposition between freedom of expression, freedom of activity of journalists, freedom of reporting, of investigating, and the security needs of the state. We have to look at the combination of both and to be able to do two, two things at the same time, to ensure the security of the citizen and to protect the freedom of their right, including freedom of expression and freedom of the media. And that's also what our organization is about with its three dimensions, including the first security dimension and the third human dimension, including freedom of expression. Thank you very much. Je vous remercie, Monsieur Désir, d'avoir répondu aussi systématiquement et de façon très détaillée à toutes les interventions. Non seulement vous avez suscité par votre discours euh, dit d'ouverture un grand nombre d'interventions, mais la présence dans la salle encore à 18h10 démontre l'intérêt euh, que nous avons toutes et tous, euh, mes chers collègues, porté euh, à vos propos et à votre analyse et à vos connaissances, euh, votre pratique dans le sujet qui nous a occupés. Dear colleagues, <coughs> I come to the closing remarks. I wish to thank you all. You have been very disciplined. You have had very engaged um, interventions. Thank you for your speeches, for all your preparations. Uh, we had the most productive session. I would also like to thank all our interpreters for their big and quite long work this afternoon. To all our speaker, speakers, Ambassador uh, Shamas from Czechoslovakia, thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Uh, our rapporteur, Kiriakos Haidiani, and our vice chair, Michael Link, as well as Andreas Baker, our secretary, and also the other staff from uh, OSCPA secretary. Thank you very much. I wish you all a great reception this evening and I look forward to toasting with you at this excellent reception we may share this evening with Austrian President of Parliament. The meeting is closed.